Hello everyone, welcome to another Draft Archetype Skeleton stream I'm doing with uh, Powell and Jason this time. I look really forward to talk about Kamigawa Neon Dynasty with these two limited minds. Um, great set, seems to be, uh, uh, well, at least it seems to be a lot better than all of the sets we had, so really enthusiastic about that. Um, yeah, before we dive in, I think I wanna shout out all the other content creators that have been doing uh, these, these set reviews, like Limited Resources, um, Alex, um, uh, uh, Ethan, of course. Uh, they mostly go over each card uh, uh, on its own. Like they evaluate how strong the card is and give it a, a letter grade. In this stream, we're doing something different. Here we are looking more at the archetypes. So not really looking at the individual cards and their strength, but more on how they interact with other cards within their respective color or the color pair that we're talking about. So again, less about the cards individually, more about the cards in the, in the archetype we are, uh, we are putting them in. Um, yeah, let's, let's dive in. As always, we'll start with some big picture stuff. Um, but before, before we do that, I'll explain how uh, a draft archetype skeleton looks uh, for us. So, we use seal deck for building our uh, uh, skeletons and the creator of seal deck has added some super cool functionality where if you go to seal deck.tech slash sets slash neo it will give you all the cards within uh, neon dynasty in your sideboard as it's called within seal deck and it allows you to build archetype skeletons it shows all the cards once at the top but by clicking the card multiple times you can put multiple copies of the card in your build, which is a super solid feature and it saved us a lot of time while building these uh, these skeletons for tonight. When we're building draft archetype skeletons, it's very important to be realistic. Uh, the goal here is not to build the best deck for, uh, for Neon Dynasty block constructed, but the goal is to build regional draft decks. And since we're all three pretty much number guys, we, uh, we defined realistic and reasonable by numbers and for us that means we're putting zero to two rares or mythics in a deck no duplicates we're putting zero to eight uncommons in a deck again no duplicates and then we fill the rest of the slots up with commons uh, and here we allow a maximum of two each the above guideline also goes for non-basic lands so in this set for example the dual lands are super solid that come into play tapped we will uh, if, if we have the option, we would add two to uh, most, if not all of the archetypes, I would say. Uh, so they are also restricted to two. And then of course we add basic lands freely. Okay, if Paul and Jason, maybe what, what I forget and what we normally do, Paul Jason, is that you introduce yourself shortly. Let's, uh, let's do that quickly before we dive into the big picture. Paul, you wanna go first? Uh, sure. Uh, also, you can use that time while I introduce myself to share the screen in real time so we can actually re respond to the presentation yes, for sure. without the delay that Twitch has. Anyway, uh, so I'm Sherkovic. I sort of started it with Sander some time ago, I think in uh, Sandicar Rising, uh, that we did our first skeleton review, just the two of us sitting and chatting in my kitchen table and in Sander's office. Um, I am a collaborator of 17 lands. I do a bunch of stuff with the uh, Magic the Gathering limited data sets. I uh, do my weekly seminar called Magic Numbers, where I dive into some topics related to the current format or general questions in Magic the Gathering. And um, yeah, that's about me. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm Jason, uh, Jason ILTG on various places, Twitch and Twitter and Discord. Uh, I I'm not that much of a content creator. I don't stream very often. Sometimes I like post very long threads on Twitter analyzing various things in limited. Um, but uh, I guess I would describe myself as somewhat of a limited grinder. Like I generally play a lot of limited, though not much in the last few sets, partially due to being more busy, partially due to the sets not interesting me that much. But this set looks really, really fun. So really excited to uh, dive in and uh, uh, explore it. Thanks, folks. Sorry for skipping over that. 
Let's uh, go. Oh, also, I'm going to very quickly go get a table so my cam is a bit less shaky, and also some water. But you, you guys, uh, start without me. Sure, you do you. Let's uh, let's dive into the big picture stuff, uh, Paul. Um, before we do, so again, we use seal deck dot tech. Uh, the slide deck, you can access that if you type exclamation mark slide deck in the chat. It'll bring up the, the Google Docs link to our slide deck. And one of the slides in our deck is this one. And here you can find links to all our draft archetype skeletons. So within the stream, we will go over one archetype build of each of the color pairs. Uh, but the Jason, Paul and I spent the time to build uh, a skeleton for most of them. And you can find links to those skeletons. Uh, here on this slide, feel free to browse through them. Um, yeah, whenever you feel like it. Big picture removal, finally, Powell. This is your um, your returning uh, chapter. Uh, this is my returning chapter that I had to very very quickly build today. Um, but generally, it shows you what is the efficiency of different non. Conditional removal, no, 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 not, uh, you know, conditionless removal, like, well, there are things that will just destroy anything. Some things are dependent on toughness of creatures, and here I show those cards. So, for example, we have the uh, Cleaving Torment, which is giving a creature minus one, minus one. And I looked at the numbers, and it sort of kills 22% of, of the creatures that are cards in the format. So it only count, I only counted creatures. There's 156 creatures in this format. There are other things that are not necessarily always creatures, like vehicles uh, or things that generate uh, uh, tokens. Uh, that also is not included in this. So I'm just looking at things that are creatures, either on their front side or on their back side. And you know, the, the one damage spell, uh, either this or the... Um, uh, or the seismic uh, wave they will kill roughly 22.4 percent creatures so this compares pretty well with all the other sets that we saw in the last time so there is not like an abundance of x ones um it's more or less what you would expect we've seen around 20 to 25 percent of um, one toughness creatures in the previous sets uh, so that doesn't uh, look uh, very much outside of that realm um, then we have the two toughness spells. So, for instance, vol uh, voltage, voltage surge, uh, the new flame tongue, uh, or the um, black minus two minus two spell will 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 kill the X twos. And there's around forty seven percent of them. This is again sort of on the lower end of what was normal in the last sets. It was between forty seven and fifty two percent of the two drops in the last couple of sets, if I remember correctly. Uh, so pretty decent. Uh, then we have the three damage spells, and Seismic Wave is a weird one, but it sort of can deal three damage to a target. And um, Kami's Flare uh, uh, just deals three, uh, and these two will kill roughly 73%. That's on the relatively higher end of the spectrum. I remember uh, in other sets, it's something like 69% of the uh, X3, so um, uh, it's a bit more. So it lo looks like this, this removal is going to be pretty efficient. On the other hand, you have to keep in mind that with mechanics like modified, some creatures are nominally free toughness, but in fact, they will be very often uh, much higher toughness because you will put a plus one, plus one counter on them or something like that. And uh, just to show you, the, there is only one spell that deals four to any creature, and that's the uh, Voltage Surge when you sacrifice an artifact. And that will kill already 91.7% creatures. So that's quite a lot. Uh, I think in the previous set it was around 85%. And that had something also to do with the werewolves being quite chunky on the backside. So um, in this particular case, it looks like for one mana you can kill more than 91% uh, of the creatures in the set, which looks pretty promising for the success rate of that spell, especially when you will be able to generate lots of artifacts that are disposable and you can sacrifice them for little uh, uh, little price all right i think that we can move from there yeah m maybe a couple of a couple of comments Paul, while i'm looking at the slide um uh i think what the uh, one uh toughness spell and i think clawing Clum torment is not the only one there's also this uncommon saga right that 
the first two chapters can put minus one minus oh one yeah yeah something. the the yeah the jitter basically I think what, the, the... yeah what, what that is going for it is that both the pilot tokens and the human monk tokens also have one toughness and i think we will see quite a lot of those especially there is the those one, one, one also spare tokens. tokens spare tokens there is also, as well yeah Yep, there's the color spirit tokens as well. There are one ones. So there is plenty of the one toughness tokens coming out. It's just the question is, do you feel like uh, spending a real card on a non-real token? That's the that's the thing. I mean, I'd rather clean them with a the thing like a seismic wave than to waste the uh, uh, the cleaving torment on that. So um, yeah. I, I, and anyway, I, I mean, agree, I'm, but... I'm not high on that card in general. Yeah, yeah no, 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 it's a people, good game you have to have. People are paying a card for the human monk, right? The the, the human monk is actually a piece of cardboard. Even oh, that's true, it's... yeah. The mana dark, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's that's definitely something that you want to remove, I would so say. Instead of bolting the bird, are you suggesting to cleave the bird, the uh, human? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and something else that I wanted to say is that both Lethal Exploit and Vaulted Search have the option to, be, to deal more than two, right? I think Lethal Exploit is the one where it adds... Yes, for every yes, modified yes, yes. creature it adds uh, minus one minus one yeah 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 and yeah. well as you said folded shirt has the four so even though the 47 percent might seem low for lethal exploit and folded shirts i think they're both like super solid spells and able oh yeah no no i think that these, these two are really good like voltage surge is definitely great um the lethal exploit is a bit tricky because it's a modified spell in a in an archetype yeah, an that archetype. doesn't necessarily have the modified creatures a lot, but yeah, I agree. There is there is a possibility of making it bigger, and you know if you if you need to make it bigger, you might go slightly out of your way to do it, and then uh, get a better spell. And it also doesn't get it counts at the moment of cast uh, how many modified creatures you had, so there is no blowout potential like with those spells uh, that don't check on uh, on cast. Yeah, also worth noting that, like, uh, shrinking removal spells, like, minus two, minus two, as opposed to two damage, you can also, like, do it in combat and uh, use it to remove, like, a 3-3 three, three by blocking it with a 2-2, two, two, for example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I can also imagine that the moth behind Seismic Wave is pretty interesting, because you can deal three to artifacts, right? So, you s <laughs> if you really want to calculate that number, then you have to... Um, <laughs> uh, remove those out of the equation, which is way too tough. Uh, I can imagine you didn't do that in this uh, in this bar chart. No, 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 God no. <laughs> no, no, God no. And what's also interesting is that there is no spell that deals five, then, right? Which is pretty unique uh, over the past sets. So I think. Well, five there is, is the X. There is the X spell. Correct, correct. And that's the that's the one that that will be doing five. So I didn't put it in because obviously it's an X spell. So. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. But I think that's good to note. I think five toughness is uh, is quite a good number. Yeah, I think oh, a yeah. good takeaway is that, like, I think creature sizing is smaller than normal, the set. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I, th I think the curve is, like, uh, there was some graphic that someone was, uh, that I saw somewhere on Twitter that was like, um, the uh, curve of this set is also lower. And some of that is because, like, sagas, the, the saga creatures, um, like those are kind of like suspend, so like you pay some amounts in time as well. Um, yeah. But so, something to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah I think I, I watched the set review, and uh, if I remember correctly, uh, there was what I think that the uncommons in red ended at four CMC, or maybe there was one that cost five or something, but that was basically it. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think the the point about sagas is pretty is pretty good, right? That automatically lowers the curve, I would say. And, and what's also pretty tough is that a lot of the, the creatures in this set bring counters with them, right? So even though they might have like three toughness base rate, I, I would count them as a 4-4 four, four or 5-5 five, five coming in. That's so that, And that's really hard to calculate, I would say, um, in the bar chart. Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's because they are, you know, they are not guaranteed, so I just took them by the face value, not yes. to be too cute about them. I'm not going to assume that 60% of the time they enter as a 3-4 uh, rather than a 2-3. Yeah, yeah. You mean you didn't look at 17 lands gameplay data and calculate how what percentage of games had uh, Oh no no I I, I, creatures? I I personally looked through every single game data from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty that we had in 17 lands. Are you happy with that answer? Yes. Yes. Okay, let's move on. Conditional removal. 
Okay, so uh, apart from the uh, conditional removal that only deals damage, there is also always some conditional removal that uh, uh, is more you know specific to a particular category of cards. And here I have the uh, the three three reach that has a five mana channel that can kill a flyer. And I looked at it, and only eighteen percent of creatures have flying. Uh, so if I remember correctly, that was roughly thirty one creatures. With, uh, no, 29. Um, give, me, give me a second, damn it. No worries, no worries. Well, while you're looking at that, does that include... 28 creatures with flying in, in, in total. Don't does worry, I don't include, have to look very Does far. that include vehicles? Because I think the white vehicle we will see quite a lot. No, I don't include any vehicles. Okay, because I think the white vehicle we will see quite a lot, and that is yes. flying. And also the uncommon two-drop vehicle is flying. And I think we will yes. see that one also a lot, because that's like an auto-include in every deck. I would say. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. But um, uh, another point of that is that there is very, very few flying creatures um, on common. So, like, out of the 28 creatures with flying I saw, I think seven are mythic rare. So, um, yeah, um, the, yeah, those are the dragons, right? That's fair. There, there are the dragons, and there is the saga that brings another dragon, and there is the kami, uh, five color kami, for example. So, there is. Surprisingly few flying creatures, but um, uh, lots of them are surprisingly high impact because they are all those like massive dragons. So yeah, keep that in mind. But I think that basically in best of one, you don't really need to worry about flyers too much. Um, so maybe in best of three, this might be a sideboard card, unless you are in the market for a 3-3 three, three defender creature. And if you are in the market for the three defender creature, this is just a bonus. Uh, so I would say, I think that um, Jason is um, is very much in the market for a three three defender based on how this uh, format is um, sized. And you know, I do agree with his thoughts on that, but he will talk about it later. Uh, so just don't put it don't put it just to kill the flyers. Uh, uh, you have to be in the market. For and we, we, so can allow, we can allow defenders to attack in Simic, right? So this might be just a... Oh, don't worry. Attacking walls is something I'm definitely going to build. <laughs> okay, and good. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I can guarantee you I'm going to build an uh, attacking walls uh, and, uh, you know, a tribute to Drowsing Tyranodon uh, kind of deck, basically. Because there is yeah. the blue wall that, uh, if it's modified, walls can attack. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I wouldn't quite say that I'm like thrilled to put the, a three three defender in my deck, but I think it might be fine. It's an enchantment. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that it's uh, like a, it 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 will actively help what your deck wants to do. While you know you would prefer other things to help you because they help you even more, but uh, this is probably going to be available a lot. Okay, so um, oh, uh, where um, I lost my. Repel the vial. Damage, where am I? Excel type creature. Yeah, no, I just like I clicked player. something like and, and like an idiot. Your um, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, the, the slide disappeared. Repel the vial. Uh, that one uh, exiles target creature with power four or greater, or it exiles target enchantment. So basically, for this statistic, I looked at um, creatures that have power four or greater, and creatures and added creatures that are enchantments to that number. Uh, um, of course, creatures that are enchantments whose power is less than four, because the ones that had power four or greater already are in that statistic. And I came up that it kills roughly quarter of the creatures. Now, this is of course not the full picture, because modifications do exist, and that might uh, let you nab um, uh, something that's uh, modified uh, also uh, in the later game. So uh, it might be like, Unlike with the damage-based removal, where you actually, when you modify something, you escape from the range. Uh, with this card, if you um, modify a creature, you might actually go into the range of Repel the Vile, so um, uh, something worth uh, worth noticing, maybe. Yeah, sure. And it also wrecks vehicles after they crew them, right? So that's like yes, 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 yes. awesome, it does. because you not only get their vehicle, but they so also get their... So keep there's, there's 13 vehicles in the, uh, in the set, so um, it won't change the numbers. That much. Vastly, and you know, some of them are three fours as well, or three twos. So there's there's not so many vehicles that will have power four or greater. Um, yeah. Then we have the fall of Lord Conda, um, and the first chapter on that one is exile target uh, creature an opponent controls with mana value four or greater. So roughly a third of the creatures has a mana value um, 
four or greater. So uh, that looks pretty solid. I mean, the thing with that is that it, it doesn't matter um, what do they modify things with what. If it costs four or greater, you can always exile it uh, with this um, uh, saga. Uh, so 33% is pretty decent. You will always have the target in, at some stage of the game. It's just that the point is you might not be able to play it early and then you will have your 1-3 wall pretty late in the game. So I don't know exactly how this is going to be um, playing out, but I, I think that, you know, just the kill a relevant creature for three mana part of the saga is actually pretty useful and uh, you basically get most of the value on the first chapter, which is great with the saga because you don't care that much about what happens next uh, to it. So if they if they disenchant it, you already did your damage, so you don't care that much. Did you count? Uh, did you count the mind control sorcery at rare for the second chapter? <laughs> um, no, I did not count the four blue and one colorless uh, spell that I might see maybe once in the history of this format. Although probably people will want to try to play it, but no, I didn't count it. I think that the second chapter is well, nothing really. And, and, and for the um, record, the one three on the backside does draw a card when it dies. Yeah, yeah no, no, it's no. It's basically it, 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 draw a card with suspend four or something. Yeah, right. yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 definitely it's definitely bringing up the value of this thing. But I mean, it's still majority of the value is in the first chapter. For sure, for sure. And then the interesting part is uh, um, the three mana exile artifact or exile enchantment, and um, obviously. This card is much broader. It kills every vehicle, it kills every aura, it kills every uh, non-creature artifact. But for the sake of this analysis, I just looked at the creature artifacts and creature enchantments. Because I think it's worth to know that 57.7% .7 of all the creatures in the set are either artifacts or enchantments. That's quite a large number. I was actually uh, pretty much surprised. So I think it's... There's 46 um, enchantment creature and 44 artifact creatures in this in the set uh, out of the 156 creatures in total. So this thing will hit quite a lot. So um, um, I'm not going to don't... dispute your numbers here, but this suggests that like 27% of creatures, more than that, is an artifact, right? If you look at the difference yeah. with repel the file, that's huge. There's so many artifact creatures then. No, 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 because, um, uh, oh. Right? That, that's I'm, I'm, strange. Again, no, let's not dive into this, but... <laughs> but no, uh, let's dive in, because I'm sitting on the whole data, and I can tell you what, 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 I, what I did wrong, because I am sh surely I must have done something wrong. This, the, it could be all the artifact... Um... There are quite some of the artifact equipment. No, no, because the number of artifact and enchantment creatures is roughly the same. Yeah, okay, so then one of those two numbers is off, right? Yeah, one of those two numbers must be off, and I, I, and I can... Act. Like, if I, if, I search, uh, if I search for a uh, number of artifact creatures in this set, it looks like about 45, compared to about, like, 160. Oh, I know, no, no, no. The, 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 it, 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 it was very simple. I, I, I divided the number uh, of the uh, power 4 or greater by... by I, I made a typo in the number, basically. I wrote 256 rather than 156. Oh, so, okay. Uh, okay. to correct it for you, uh, the Repel the Vile should be 42.3%. Uh, yeah, I thought so. Okay. That, okay, so that card is even better than, than shown on the slide here. Yeah, uh, perfect. So, uh, auto-include. Yeah, no, basically. very very, very good catch. It's just, it was just a typo. No worries. <laughs> auto-include Repel the Vile. Check. Yeah, no, especially, especially with any combat tricks, it also blows them out of the yeah, water. It's, so uh, it's, yeah. it's a solid card. But I, I would say that Fade into Antiquity is also something that is probably worth considering. Oh, 100%. Because you can stop those sagas before they actually turn into creatures as well. So you ping them for much more value. And, you know, there are some uh, artifacts that are non-creature that are probably also useful to kill. Like, the, you know, the thing that accrues counters and then can kill a creature and ping you in the face for quite a lot. And you can get rid of that, for example. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, the, the last one is more for cuteness, but um, uh, Wanderer's Interventions, uh, it deals four damage, but only to an attacking creature. So it has a slightly different number than just deal four damage because it cannot deal the four damage to defender creatures. And based on that, it loses 2% of targets. 
But it deals four yeah. to blocking creatures as well, right? Yeah, it's a damage. Ah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Let's... Oh no. That that means that the defenders are back on the menu. Okay. Good. 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 <laughs> Okay. And anyway, we know that the defender creature can attack, you just need to put a plus one, plus one counter on them. True. Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on. Jason, you want to take this one? Yeah, so uh, the set architecture for this set is like really interesting, actually. Um, you may have seen on Twitter, someone, maybe like Lord Tupperware or something, commented on uh, like the set, the lead set designer for this set is uh, Dave Humphreys. Um, who is the same person who led, uh, I believe, War of the Spark, Ikoria, and Kaldheim, which were all, like, excellent sets. Uh, also one of the, I think, like, Hour of Devastation or something? The Hour of Devastation, like that. yeah, yeah, that, that's exactly. Yeah, so, like, uh, so, uh, th that's, like, one of the things that's, like, uh, makes me really excited for this set, and just, like, the look of it. Like, it de definitely looks very similar, where there's, like, a lot of interweaving archetypes a lot of thing and a lot of like uh commons that can go like in various different places and like connect together archetypes but like the main set architecture is that you have blue here so so you have two sides roughly blue is like heavy in artifacts synergy like there, there's a lot of blue stuff that cares about artifacts uh, and green on the other hand is all about enchantments um and those two i believe are the uh furthest ends on on that spectrum and then uh next there's red also cares about artifacts and white also cares about enchantments but like less so than blue and green and then black is like in the middle uh, i think like the like flavor wise like black will like uh use whatever to further its own goals or whatever uh something like that so like you know you can see like blue red is like the artifact color pair uh white green is the enchantment color pair and also I, when i was looking through the set i think i think this also has another uh, like correlates with another spectrum which is i think the blue side of the scale here is much more assertive and the green side is much more defensive where you have a lot of like cheap ninja uh creatures like uh like the one one flyer in blue and like uh the two one ninja and the man of war ninja in blue that all incentivize you to like play an assertive like tempo game um, where I, and like red also leans more on the aggressive side, whereas uh, green like is really like really wants you to ramp and like be defensive, get get to the late game, and there's not much aggression there. So that was something I found really interesting, and I think like it does kind of follow this scale where like white normally is more aggressive, but I think in this set might not actually be that aggressive. Weirdly, yeah. So. Um, for the next slide, um, did, did, did just we wanted to add one point, Jason, which we talked about uh, uh, before the show. The big, the, the 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 effect of black being in the middle here. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's another thing. Where, so so because like I think blue and green uh, like are the single colors that have like the strongest identities in the set as well. Where like um, we're gonna in the next few slides we're gonna go over some of like big pictures for colors. But we we were only really able to make the three slides for this partially because time, partially because, but but also partially because like. Um, blue and green have like very strong identities where you can like identify th this is a package of commons that like all work together, all like go go toward the same game plan, and you can say and you can say oh I want to build my deck based around these commons and use that in uh, several color pair archetypes, whereas like black black it seems like very like like not very focused. There there's not really like. Uh, a, a straw like when we get to the uh, big picture slides, uh, you'll see what I mean for blue and green. Whereas black, like it feels more like a support color. Like there's some strong, there are definitely some strong cards, but they don't really. It doesn't really feel like you can be mono black. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, or, well, obviously, you're not going to be like mono any color really in limited, um, except in Eldraine. Uh, I, I think I saw a discussion. I think it was on Reddit where where people were discussing whether there would be a, a artifact deck in this set. Like, a, <laughs> and I was like, why, 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 <laughs> why would you even try to go for that? Why would we even discuss whether that's a thing? Like, how hard is it to include one color in your deck, right? No. Okay, yeah. Mind. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, but so uh, for this next slide, uh, so blue, I think, 
the strongest synergies in blue, I think, are actually ninja. So specifically, these two common ninjas I have here in the top left, Moon Circuit Hacker and uh, Moon Stereo Specialist, I think are really strong. Um, Moon Circuit Hacker is just like, a, basically it's a one mana 2-1 draw card, well, where you also have to return a creature to your hand. Um, but like, uh, as you can see uh, in the top right, there's some enablers for this. Like, uh, most uh, most excitingly, Network Disruptor, uh, one mana, one one flyer, um, so it gets in really easily on turn two. So like, you can imagine the curve, Disruptor turn one, uh, attack, uh, put in Hacker, draw a card, uh, replay Disruptor, and uh, you've basically played a two mana, two one draw card with uh, and gotten in with it on that turn. Um, and that's like really strong. Um, and then uh, you can also, uh, there's also Searchlight Companion to help enable that, which like gives you a bit of value uh, in, a, in the form of more 1-1 one -one tokens when you uh, replay it after you picked it up. Then like the Mana War Moonstar Specialist, like Mana War is just a historically strong card. This costs one more on its front side technically, but you can ninjutsu it in for three. And then, like, you can, uh, basically this just, like, has a lot of cheap creatures that, uh, can attack for early damage, and also, uh, has some evasive threats with, um, like, the flyers that are the, uh, that I listed as ninjutsu enablers, along with, like, a couple more, like, Puzzle Maker as a 1-4 flyer that scries one repeatedly seems strong, and Sky Swimmer Koi as just, like, a 4-mana 3-3 three, three flyer that, like, gives you some, uh, card advantage, as we've seen in many previous sets, also seems decent. And then, like, so, so you have this, like, cheap package of, like, uh, evasive threats and, like, some tempo with, uh, like, the Moonstair Specialist. And then I think you can then leverage this with things like Suit Up and uh, Brute Suit to, like, like, you'll have a bunch more material on the board. Things like, you know, your random 1-1 one -one flyers that you were using for ninjutsu, and like maybe your moon circuit hacker uh, like got in once or twice and now like can't really attack because it's just a 2-1 and like you're having trouble trading it off, but you can then use things like uh, th these two augments that I listed here at common, and also there's various other things in other colors and higher rar rarities, but um, like you can turn your, uh, you can use your small creatures that aren't doing anything to crew your 4-3, or you can uh, cantrip and make them 4-5s for a turn, which can really help with um, continuing that tempo plan. So yeah, I think this is like just a, a pretty strong package in blue that I'm pretty excited for. But of course, we'll have to see how that plays out. Yeah, yeah, super cool. I I'm not sure um, how, how quick other people are on this stuff, but when I looked at Moonsnare, Moonsnare Specialist, I was like, why do I want to ninjutsu this, right? It doesn't have a hits the enemy type effect. But, but then I thought about it a bit longer where you can actually, if 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 an opponent makes a a good block and threatens to kill one of your creatures, you can actually ninjutsu this in on an unblock creature and then bounce the creature that would, would kill yours. I'm not sure if that was like your your immediate reaction, but I it took me a couple of minutes to realize that. I think that's oh, yeah, super and you, solid. You, you know, you, you can, you can uh, do that and then ninjutsu the Moonsnare specialist again uh, for the extra cuteness. Yeah, super yeah, solid. Uh, yeah, like even... so. I think even just a four mana two two with ETB already bounce something. good. Good card. I, I think that, that's like good, like decent, like yeah. not not insane. Um, but definitely gets better once you consider that you're already in a temp in a deck that wants to be tempo oriented, wants to keep connecting with your creatures. Um, and then ninjutsu is just like a lot of upside actually there's so many weird tricks you can do with ninjutsu maybe, maybe maybe we should have even made a slide for it but like like for example um you, you can just like pick up additional creatures to rebuy their etbs like uh i, I think like gaffin verge made a video with a, a bunch of like uh, talk, talking about a bunch of weird things you can do with ninjutsu. Uh, you can, like, l if you have, like, two Moonstair specialists in your hand, you can uh, put one onto, like, ninjutsu one, and then, like, swap it with the other one to, like, bounce two things. It just lets you do all sorts of uh, weird stuff with, um, when combined with, like, invasive creatures and other ninjutsu. So, like, it's, it's all, all, like, it's small upside, but it, it does add up to a lot, I think. Yeah, for sure. I'm waiting for, you know, uh, 
having first strike damage, then ninjutsu the first striker, replace it with a non-first striker and heal the second. That's pretty good too. Yeah, that's good. Oh man, opponent goes to blocks, double block on one of your creatures, leaves the other one unblocked. Moonsnare specialist, bounce one of the blockers. Ah, oh, yeah, that's good. That, that, that's oh, gonna be good. Uh, that's going to be gross. I, I, I was surprised you um, you added Searchlight campaign here. So what you're so, so my idea with Ninjitsu, but I, as you know, I haven't been playing Magic for that long, so I don't think I've ever played with Ninjitsu before. Well, I did in Modern Horizons. Did you play in Modern Horizons? Yeah, 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 but not 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 in any of the other um, previous, like not in Alt Kamigama. The the three mana seems pretty costly, right? For for replaying it, how do you feel about yeah, that? That one I'm not that sure about, but it is it is a one one flyer, and it's better to bounce the hand than your than like Moonfolk Puzzle Maker, right? Oh, like for sure. Again. For sure. Any, any value from bouncing it to hand. And, like, you need something... I think you can't just rely on network disruptors, because, like, I think everyone will know that, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. that's a really good common, and we'll be taking those highly, so you probably won't be able to get that, like, get those all the time. Um, but there aren't actually that many other enablers in, like, at common in blue, uh, as you might expect. Like, you, they're, they're not gonna print, like, a ton of one mana, one one flyers or something. Like, no, you, sure. in blue white, you can use, like, the other one mana, one one flyer. There, there's other ways and other colors. Um, but, like, I think it's probably going to be fine, like, uh, as just, like, a bit more value uh, when you pick it up, right? You get, like, another, you get to replay it and get another one one. Making two one ones for three mana of one of which has flying isn't even that bad. And like if you're if you're like repeatedly tempoing them out and like keeping uh, like removing their blockers, like just uh, having a bunch of one ones can actually get there. Um, and you know you can always chump with the one one. So it's you know not, it's probably not ideal, but I think it's uh, it, it's like. A good thing to mention as part of this package. Oh, also, like you know, the, uh, with brute suit and suit up, like those don't care what size your creature is. So, like, it's just good to have more material. Basically, what I think this, uh, what what I see when I look at like this blue ninja deck is you're putting a bunch of you're like just putting a bunch of material on the battlefield while sn slowing your opponent down, and then like trying to leverage that into a win somehow. Yeah, sweet for sure. Owl, anything you wanted to add to, to Blue before we go to the next color? No, I think that, you know, that, that, that's exactly what um, uh, what the deck, what, what the color wants to do. I mean, the only thing that I want to add is that this, like, focuses the ninja synergies, but I think rightfully so, because I think that a lot, large chunk of the uh, color in the, in the set is focusing on those ninja uh, strategies and lets them enable. But that doesn't say that there is not uh, another complete um, package in there. Like the ar artifact package seems to be quite strong, and I don't think that um, you focused on, on on that particular side of blue here. But it's it's there. It's just I think that ninja synergies are more straightforward, and um, uh, they are let's say like probably they will be easier to build in the beginning of the format. But I, th I think that the longer we play, the more intrinsic synergies in blue discover and um, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Jason is going to be on the forefront of it and I'm, I'm, I'm waiting uh, eagerly to see those Twitter threads yeah uh, I, I will be eager to discover such things as well <laughs> okay let's go to red Paul you want right, to take so, this one yeah uh, so basically um, this is the Oh God, I'm 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 absolutely awful with the uh, dealing with the Discord uh, chat. I just switched my slide off again. But basically, I described here all four synergy pairs for red, just to show you how much overlapping synergies you get. So uh, basically, red blue wants to have artifacts and artifact creatures, and um, that's the shtick of the of the. Um, color pair. I think that this color pair is a sort of like afterthought, so it probably will be slightly less supported than other ones, but I might be wrong. Uh, but, you know, to make it work, you have cards like Kami of Industry, the one that lets you reanimate um, uh, an artifact from your graveyard with a cost um, free or less. Uh, or, for example, you have the Rabbit Battery, Rabbit Battery, 
uh, one one haste that can equip something um, uh, and give it plus one plus one haste for one mana, which is a great rate. And I think that this card is just amazing. But when you think about it, it also has the modify uh, synergies with green. And Rabbit Battery, even though it's an artifact creature, it's also a modification. So that goes swiftly to this um, other archetype. And here we have a couple of cards like the Aki Ember Keeper, which is a 2-1 uh, that um, uh, whenever a modified creature dies, creates a 1-1. Uh, so for instance, you equip something with Rabbit Battery, swing it, they block it, kill it, you get a 1-1 that you can uh, sort of use later to, to ping them uh, a, bit, a bit more. And we have the Upriser Renegade, uh, that one gets plus 2 plus 0 for each other modified creature you control. So you modify something else, this one becomes a 3-3, three, three, uh, quite a decent body, you attack with it, it kills another 3-3, three, three. you get your 1-1 one, one, uh, Colorous Spirit token from Aki Ember Keeper, for example, and, um, and then you can continue with that. And the third synergy that's uh, with the white is uh, Attack Alone by a Samurai or Warrior. And I didn't select Aki Ember Keeper and Upriser Renegade by accident, because both of them are a Warrior and a Samurai. They would actually fit in some way into the other um, uh, synergy with Samurais and Warriors attacking alone. And here I have a couple of red examples. Aki Ronin is another Samurai. Whenever a Samurai or Warrior control attacks alone, you may discard a card, and then if you do, draw a card. So basically, rummage every time you attack. So let's say you have the Upriser Renegade in this deck. You modify it. Uh, you modified something else, it becomes a 3-3, three, three, then it attacks, it rummages. Um, uh, if you have also the Aki Ember, Ember, Ember Keeper, you will make the 1-1. One, one. That's unfortunately not a Samurai or a Spirit, but it's something, it's a body. Uh, and, you can, and you can work like that. Uh, then we have uh, Haiko Yamazaki, which is also a Samurai General. Um, uh, and this one, whenever a Samurai or Warrior you, um, uh, you control attacks alone, you may cast target artifact card from your graveyard this turn. So here we go back and the Samurai Warrior synergy uh, also overlaps with the artifact sacrifice uh, theme because if you sacrifice artifacts, you will have plenty of uh, possibilities of uh, reanimating them. And you can see that we made basically a full circle and we the black-red uh, uh, color pair wants to be having artifacts but also sacrificing them and here I gave the uh, experimental synthesizer, which which is a card that I'm going to be watching its win rate very very carefully uh, after the first two weeks because I think that in the beginning this card is going to be badly played from, uh, quite regularly, but I think that it has a potential and it will be interesting if it works great uh, in the later stages of the format or is it a dud? But basically, it's a one mana. You can uh, when it comes into the battlefield or leaves it, um, you can exile the top card of your library, and until end of turn, you may play that card. So basic, and and you can sacrifice it to make a two two samurai again. Hello, um, uh, creature uh, token with vigilance. So you basically can play it, cast something off the top. If you have a leftover mana, you can sacrifice it, make a samurai. If you have Haiko Yamazaki. You attack with the Samurai next turn, you bring back Experimental Synthesizer to the battlefield, make a Samurai, you, you, see, the, you see the pattern there. And if you have like the black, um, red signpost uncommon, you also manage to uh, deal some damage because of, uh, because of uh, sacrificing things. So, uh, you know, you, you can do quite a lot with those kind of But what I wanted to draw your attention to in red is that red has very overlapping synergies. And this was something that was worrying me in uh, Crimson Vow. So basically in Crimson Vow, lots of cards were only good in one archetype. And I think that here we're going to have a very, very different format than the one in Crimson Vow, where cards are pretty good in multiple archetypes based on their abilities because they've been designed to be so. So it's going to be very interesting. It's going to be easier to make a couple of picks that put you on the uh, path to draft uh, artifact deck uh, where you can easily pivot into a different deck or maybe you can have a three color pile because you have the lands in the format this time uh, when you sort of like have pockets of Ikoria style when you have a bit of modified synergy but you mainly focus on artifacts and you get uh, three color to do so uh, so I'm um, really keen on seeing how this is going to play out but it looks like this is going to be one hell of a brain teaser in terms of format yeah 
another thing I want to point out is like you can see with all of these uh, like, like with blue I was describing like one like like large synergistic package where like everything is working towards like one thing and here in red you can see more like a lot of more flexible cards that like fit into any archetype and I think this plays into what I was talking about before with like uh, the set architecture where like blue and green have these like very strong identities and then like red uh, red and white like uh, help uh, are, are more flexible have, have some more like can do uh, some of those synergies themselves but also like have a lot of flex cards can play support a lot and then black especially is like very much mostly a support color uh, like not not having a strong identity itself but like um yeah black having... identity is yeah I have some unconditional removal. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and like it has other uh, good cards too. Like it like it has this, like, one artifact ninja that like seems decent. It has like uh, like an artifact one one they discard card that seems like it. I think that, you know the, the, the sacrifice. The, the two mana one to flyer. I'm pretty pretty interested how that one is going to play out. And I, yeah, I, I personally am super stoked for the the three mana tap make a treasure. Um, that, that that card seems sold as well, and and we, we don't have a big picture of white slide, but I think if you if you exchange the word artifact with enchantment here, you basically created the the white slide. I would say right where they also yeah, have the samurai. Yeah, basically all the samurai and warriors in white are an enchantment creature. Uh, yeah, a dog, and thus they 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 fit into the green white uh, the green white deck. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, very definitely, very definitely. similar to red. So uh, again, just reiterating how I love the the slide with the with the spectra. I think it's yeah, it's super super solid. Yeah, you can see that most clearly in that there's the uh, um, there's the uh, other Yamazaki. Uh, yeah, I forget the first name. Yamazaki the poet yes. in white, uh, which is exactly the same as the red one, except like slightly different stats, and you get to recast an enchantment instead of an artifact. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then the, uh, I, I think the white green version of artifact sacrifice. Uh, is enchantment channel, which is how you get enchantments in your graveyard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and th there's plenty of that. L last question from my side before we go to the next slide. Rabbit battery. Is that like a battery that contains electricity or is it like from battering? I mean, isn't it just like a, a pun on, Duras uh, on Energizer? <laughs> oh, yes, that's probably it. Yes, so, so, <laughs> Duracell or whatever. Yeah, yes. there's always rabbits in the battery advertisement. I think that is like. A... So it is battery, as in thing that contains energy. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. I mean, um, I assume it's not uh, uh, being uh, uh, physically abused by a rabbit. Uh, no. Well, but it's a battering. It's a beating as well, right? So it could also be. Yeah. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm pretty sure that there's plenty of puns in here, and some of them include commercials for. Uh, Do the cell batteries, yeah. But this this kept me awake awake last night, so I'm happy that we resolved this one. Yeah, okay. it's rabbit battery, not rabbit rabbit batter or battering. <laughs> like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the card is a beating. I think we we can all agree yeah. on that. Yeah, it's, it looks very good. It's a house. Okay, Jason, green. Yeah, so green is the other side of the spectrum here, where with blue, you had, like, artifacts, you had uh, an aggressive tempo game plan. With green, uh, I think you have an enchantment, like, an enchantment very rampy game plan. Uh, and so the reason why I have this one card, Season of Renewal, like, big and into in the center here, is because, like, when I was, like, trying to build, like, a green half deck uh, yesterday, uh, I was looking at like all of these ramp cards, all, all of these like good cards in green, and like it, it looked like like a lot of them were actually enchantments that had channel. And what that lets you do with this uh, card, Season of Renewal, is uh, so you know it, it's a double regrowth, which is like fairly strong, thanks like Soul Salvage and Dominaria. Um, and the normal problem with those kinds of cards is. Uh, sometimes you don't have any creatures in your graveyard, right? Some, sometimes you don't have things to get back, and like you need to go like. Sometimes you need to play a really long game before you have enough stuff in your graveyard where it becomes like actual value, where you're getting back two good cards rather rather than like there's only one card in your graveyard, or like maybe you have a random two drop that traded off, but like isn't going to be relevant anymore. 
But here, with these uh, cards, uh, you can get them into the graveyard early with channel. Uh, for, so some examples. Uh, under ramp here I have careful cultivation and greater tanuki. Both of these have a channel ability that's relatively cheap. Two mana for cultivation, three mana for tanuki. That ramps you. So the cultivation makes a 1-1 one, one green monk with tap, add green, basically like a uh, mana dork. Um, and Tanuki uh, is just a ramping growth for 3 mana. Uh, both of these are instant speed, by the way, and so is its Season of Renewal, which can be pretty interesting. Um, and so, yeah, that, that gets you, that like accelerates you on mana, which uh, is even more conducive to a game plan of like going late and spending mana uh, on like buying back cards with Season of Renewal. And they're also, I think, pretty strong commons here, uh, Cultivation and Tanuki, because like they, they're they ramp you, which is what I think Green wants to do, and they're also uh, mobile cards where, uh, like, Cultivation, the normal problem with, like, a 1-1 one, one mana dork is, like, in the late game it becomes pretty dead, but Cultivation in the late game, uh, you can just, like, use it to enhance a cr or modify a creature and, like, have a big reach blocker or attacker. Um, and, I, and I think Greater Tanuki is even better at this as a, just, like, a 6-mana six 6-5. Six um, not as good as, uh, Ravdis Lindworm and Honey Mammoth in terms of stabilizing you because it like has uh, uh, is uh, smaller as a six five rather than a six six and doesn't gain you life. But I think it's still pretty sizable. And as we saw, there isn't any five damage removal this time. So I think like six five is actually still like about as big as six six. Uh, it, definitely it has some downsides, but like uh, it's not gonna like get removed by their uh, five damage removal spell at the very least. Then you have this, uh, another one of the my green top commons, I think, uh, Jukai Preserver, is just like a really solid creature. Uh, four mana, three, three, that puts a counter on something, so it could be a four, four. Uh, and you can channel it to uh, give two things counters. Um, you can't put two on the same thing, but like, uh, you get two, you can get two counters out of it for three mana. Um, just another solid card at common that's an enchantment creature and has channel just another thing you can get back with your season of renewal um then you have like uh if you want to have this uh late game plan like ramp, ramp into lots of recursion uh then you want some defensive speed as well and you have that in for in the form of the one one death toucher in green and the three three defender reach are both like fairly good uh creatures if you want defensive speed and they're also both enchantments and they both trade off pretty well early. That like what you want to do with them is play them, block, trade off, and then you can maybe get them back with season of renewal in the late game. Like it's not ideal. Maybe you want some like bigger stuff, but at least it's something. And then in terms of splash, uh, like uh, if you have this like late game strategy, uh, you probably also want to splash with the jewel lands to get more power, be able to play more powerful things like rares, things like that. And there's a couple things that are like, that seem a couple of cards that seem really good for this. First of all, Sunblade Samurai. It's uh, four and a white for a uh, four four vigilance uh, enchantment creature that has channel. Importantly, it costs colorless mana to channel. You you get to pay two. Uh, colorless mana, discard it, and you get a planes, uh, and you gain two life. So it's basically like, you know, uh, perfect for this uh, strategy where you get to use it for fixing early, uh, buy it back, and then cast it as, as your, uh, as like a five mana four four, just like more material. It's, it's basically planes environmental sciences. Yeah, yeah. It's like, like if you, it's like basically. It splashes itself, right? Like, you could play, like, two of these in your deck with no other white cards to play a planes, and it splashes itself. <laughs> um, and, like, uh, you know, sometimes maybe getting a planes isn't that great if you don't have other white cards, but at the very least, like, if you're ramping, like, it's not that bad to just, like, get a land and gain two life for two mana. For sure. Yeah, course, and you can still get the samurai back with the season. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Which is what I mean when I mean when I said it splash itself. You you okay. channel it, get the planes, then later get it back and cast it. <laughs> um, then of course there's the blue green gold card uh, at uncommon, which uh, which does a really really slow but also pretty powerful thing with season of renewal, where since it's an enchantment and it has channel tuna green uh, like just regrowth a thing, you can pay 
uh, four and two green in order to channel Sky Turtle, get back Season of Renewal, then cast Season of Renewal, get back Sky Turtle, and something else. And you've basically paid six mana in order to have a regrow with buyback. <laughs> and it's pretty slow, but also green ramps a lot, and that can certainly win games. So I mean, you should keep that information hidden from uh, Ethan. <laughs> for as long as physically possible, because yeah, I, if I'm he sure. finds out this loop the loop, that's going to be the end of his streaming career, because those games will just go forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm sure we'll see some sweet decks from Ethan. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, th this I think is all just like, like, like with Blue, like a strong, like very cohesive package. Like this time built around like this one card season of renewal. I'm not sure like how highly you want to prioritize it. I think you probably want, like, between one and three in each deck uh, that you, like, like in these decks. Um, but I don't know how it compared, like, how you prioritize it compared to the other good green commons, like the ramp creatures or, like, preserver as a solid thing. But yeah, um, I'm very excited for this archetype. I'm very excited to try to play five color with it, uh, uh, as enabled by Greater Tanuki, but... We'll see. Yeah, super cool. Uh, yeah, it, looks, it's, uh, it looks super sweet. I, I, I really... Uh, also, Jason made a very good Twitter thread about it. Uh, so, um, yeah, go and check that stuff out because it was uh, interesting to see it in written version as well. Yeah, for sure. Hey, a couple of things that I, I want to highlight. So there are a couple of channel cards where, and I think that's a bit counterintuitive for newer players, where the channel mode is actually the main card, right? And I think Careful Cultivation is a good example there. Yeah, um, that's an excellent example. Yeah. yeah, so basically Careful Cultivation is a two-drop that says, I'm a 1-1 one, one monk and I, I, I tap for mana. Um, and the other, the, uh, the other stuff is just gravy. And there are a couple more channel cards, I think, that have that aspect to them. Um, so so be, be, be aware of that, that, that you can count careful cultivation as a two drop in your deck um another thing i wanted to yeah. mention is that you mentioned two sunblade samurai and they they splash themselves i think sunblade samurai is also a great card to lower your land count so, so to me if i have two in my deck i'll go down to 16 in the average deck doesn't really matter how the curve looks like if it's an average curve doesn't need to be like super low i think i'm happy playing 16 lands if i have two samurais how do you guys look at I would at only that? do it if I'm white, basically, because you, you want to be too cute and... Uh, oh, yeah, uh, not, not in this ramp example that Jason yeah. gave, right? But just if, I, if I'm a white player. So first of all, I think Sunblade Samurai is, is a super good card. It basically slots in every archetype that I built that had white in it. And now you're also throwing it into green whatever. So that, that basically puts it in every archetype possible close to. Um, do you agree that two of these are rela relevant, yeah, like a land in your deck? Uh, well, okay. I mean, on one hand, so th there's a couple things there. I, I think I think it would be more accurate to say that two of them makes me go down to 17 lands <laughs> rather than going down to 16. In the round thing. Well, I mean, I think also the thing is, right, like if you're putting two five drops in your deck, sometimes you want to cast them. And so like, I, and I think white decks aren't going to be that aggressive in this set. I think like there's another white card, the six mana... Sorcery that makes three two twos in Squires three. I think that's a very strong card in white. I, I that that's my hot take for this set. I know yeah, some yeah. people disagree, but like I think that white wants to be playing that late game. Wants to like get to those like uh uh like five and six drops. So I wouldn't go. I I would say like honestly playing eighteen lands is underrated. Like <laughs> like I think you should. I, I think most of your white decks will still want to be playing seventeen lands, even if they have sam the two samurai. And without the samurai, maybe even eighteen. You know, who knows? Yes. Yes. I think that in best best of one, this picture is maybe slightly different. I think that in best of one, lots of decks want to play sixteen lands, and you can trim on that. Especially when you know you almost have a guarantee of getting two lands in your opening hand, and if you have couple Sunblade Samurai's, it's going to be probably enough to get. Oh yeah, that's fair. That's definitely fair. Yeah. G. John in chat made a, a reference to Bounce being better in this set, uh, especially for blowing out uh, the, the Exalted Creature from Red-White. 
um, uh, same thing with uh, with Ninjitsu. I think that's in reference to the uh, blue channel ability on the Sky but, Turtle. I mean, the the question for me is, uh, do you really blow out the red white deck uh, by by bouncing something up? Because you will attack with your bad creatures because they will get better because of the good creatures that you don't attack with. So bouncing a bad creature probably doesn't blow it up. It slows you down on a couple of turns, I guess, because you don't yeah. get one attack, but... Yeah, it's, like, probably fine. I, I don't... I don't know whether, like, that... I, I think I, I'd have to play the format before, like, yeah. I had yeah. an answer to that. I agree, I agree. Like, assuming you want the Exalted creature to get in, with like trample or something, then yeah, bouncing it will be savage. But if you're just attacking to get the triggers, then bouncing it, well, it's, it's fine, right? Doesn't do a lot. Uh, but you you get the triggers anyway. Exactly, exactly. Okay, I think it was most of our big picture stuff related to a single color, which means that we're now diving into the uh, the two color archetypes, all ten of them. Let's dive into Simic is the first one. Um, the reason that I, I, I put Simic right after uh, the, the, the big picture green slide is because when I built Simic, um, well, the, the, the sort of the, the story of the, of the archetype was that I should focus on channel, right? So I thought, okay, if I, if I like channel, then I probably like graveyard recursion, like, like Jason said. Uh, then I'm probably going to ramp a little because some of the uh, channel cards like uh, the Greater Tanuki, and the careful cultivation, they, they move me towards ramp. So does the colossal sky turtle. So I was like, okay, so I'm building a a, 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 a ramp deck that uh, wants to uh, want some graveyard recursion. And I basically ended up in a mono green deck, splashing a couple of, well, let's say two uncommons out of blue that draw me cards, a blue mythic because well hey we had two rare slots and i really like the the jinkataxius and i think you can get to seven mana with this deck and then there's tamiya's completion because well as always simic uh, lacks a bit of removal so yeah what's what's more to say um i yeah i think simic especially when you're when you're going the channel route i think you're leaning very hard on your green cards um, a card that I would like to highlight is the Containment Construct. Um, the card got uh, quite a low grade from, from most of the, the card reviews that I've seen so far. And I really like it because I, I really think, especially in a deck like this, where most of your cards have channel, a dust, you're, you're discarding them. I think a card like Containment Construct can, uh, can bring you some serious card advantage. Yeah, that's... All I have to say about Simic. Anything you guys want to add, uh, Paul, Jason? Yeah, I'm glad I'm not crazy in terms of my uh, green archetype build. No, for sure. You agree with me? Yeah, we were we were pretty much uh, pretty much on the line there. Yeah, for sure. But well, I have to say I didn't give enough thought to the Simic so far. It's uh... I think that after that stream, I'm just gonna just jump on the uh, draft simulator and see what I can, you know, cobble together by by repeating it quite a lot. Um, Gurk has a has a question in chat. Does channel count as playing the card for the containment construct? That's a very good question. I don't think so, right? No, so you... um, no, I don't think so. I, I think you can channel it. Yeah. Yeah, so you can't channel then channel you have to play it. Play the other side, yeah. Yeah, so no Gurk, you cannot channel it twice. You you have to channel it first because that that means you're discarding it, and then you can play the normal side, uh, based on containment construct. Yeah, I'm not convinced that containment con construct is that good. Uh, I'll have to see how it plays out. Like, it looks like a lot of the channel stuff is like very expensive to like play both halves of in the same turn. And, like, you know, there's also some things where it's, like, not that impactful to do both things, like careful uh, careful cultivation, for example. So, I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll, we'll have to see. Um, for sure. Uh, I think it's broken with the rare lands, that's for sure. Like, the, the Poseidon will endure. Oh, okay. I have that in this list. I think it's 100% very strong with that. Yeah. 
I, I think that you know also with Tanuki, you 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 probably are not uh, outside of the realm of uh, of of making it into some sort of free four color concoction. Yeah, for sure. I, I I agree. I think it's basically just green plus plus some stuff like like Jason already touched on. Okay. Wanna wanna move on to the next one? Next one is is it? Do you want me to bring up the? Let's do that. Let's do that. I prepared it anyway, so I'll, I'll bring it up like this so we can hover over some cards. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. Yeah. Um. So, is it again? It's just uh, blue red. Uh, of course, it's blue red. Uh, it's like it has a lot of artifact synergies. Um. So you. So some standout cards that you might want. Obviously, there's the. Uncommon uh, signpost, uh, the 2-2 two -two flyer for two, um, that makes your artifacts cheaper, which, you know, uh, artifacts generally have a lot of colorless mana in them. There's, there, there are some, like, cheap one mana artifacts here that it wouldn't discount, but, like, you will definitely get some mana advantage, and just, like, a 2-2 two -two flyer for two is just, like, a good body. And then you have um, Patchwork Automaton is probably pretty strong here. Uh, it's... Uh, two mana, one one ward two that gets bigger when you cast artifact spells, and you're probably going to be casting a lot of artifact spells, especially with um network disruptor. Um, picking that up with like a ninja a ninja two card or like searchlight companion, uh, will like let you re like cast it again, which is pretty strong. Yeah, I heard. What is, sorry, specifically the synergy with uh, the automaton is pretty strong there. Like you just, it, it'll go a bit faster than you might expect. And then of course, um, uh, Restoration Specialist is another really strong payoff here, just like doubling up all your artifacts. Um, it like, it, it's also just a fine body, five mana, three, four flyer, though like, you know, it has to live a turn for it to do anything. Um, oh, another cute thing to mention, uh, Kami of Industry, you could play it on turn 5, or sorry, on turn 6, when you have 6 mana, get back some artifact creature, say, like, you know, a Searchlight Companion or a Network Disruptor, attack with it, uh, attack with the creature, and then ninja to the creature back to your hand, and then you won't have to uh, sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Uh, so uh, that's another synergy to keep in mind. Yeah, you're then ninja just... with uh, Moonstruck Attacker, then, right? That's the that's the combo. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The the specifically Moonstruck Hacker. Yeah, yeah. It, for the it's one and ninja two. For the people at home, and I, I think that's a super super sweet uh, one to punch. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I don't know. There's not much else to say. You can do some like artifact sack. Uh, synergies here also with uh, Scrapyard Steelbreaker at common is just like a four mana three four beater that like uh, like gets really big when you sack a bunch of artifacts or like Sakenzin Smelter I think it's called like a two mana two two that turn that you can like use to turn your dinky artifacts into three ones which are like slightly less dinky <laughs> um, and then use like experimental synthesizer with those in order to get value I still don't know how how good ex experimental synthesizer will be um like it looks powerful but it is kind of awkward that you have to cast the card that turn uh, like it's not a reckless impulse because like reckless impulse um you get two turns to cast it like this turn and the next one synthesizer you have to do it immediately so i don't know how awkward it'll be we'll see yeah yeah for sure um i think you can also just use it on turn one of two to to find a land on turn two, like turn turn one, play a mountain. Turn two, play this. If you find a land, you play it out. Otherwise, you play a land, you don't get the trigger. Yeah, it's it's still awkward though because then you're skipping out on your turn two, right? Like you're you're not be able to play a two drop. Like you got a bit of value, but uh, it's it, it seems kind of counter to what like blue is trying to do in there with being tempo oriented but again like again uh, blue might have a bunch of like cheap stuff that you can like like you, maybe you play the synthesizer on turn four and you like you'll probably hit something you can cast yeah yeah for sure i think if you if you have two synthesizers in your deck i think you should also actively try to keep your curve low right to uh to, to yeah, yeah um, give you a good chance of, of playing the card 
Oh, one thing to note, you cannot activate ninjutsu from exile. So like if you exile a ninja, you can't ninjutsu the ninja in. That's a good point. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. We uh we lost you on camera by the way, uh Jason. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, sorry. I turned off my camera so I can eat. Yeah, and, oh and you're you're good. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Gru, you wanna take that one, uh Powell? Yeah, sure. So basically, the, the theme uh, allegedly is uh, modified creatures, uh, whatever that might mean. So basically, modified creatures are any creature that has any sort of counter. Um, creatures with auras that are yours, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and creatures with equipment. So um, there is plenty of stuff that can do that thing. So for example, Rabbit Battery is the one one haste we already talked about. Um, you can equip for one red uh, to give a creature plus one plus one and haste and that will count then as a modified creature so you can move it around to modified multiple creatures um, you have some auras uh, I think that gift of wrath is the interesting one it gives a plus two plus two and menace I think that this thing if you can position it well uh, is pretty good in this deck but it's also pretty good in the samurai attacks alone deck because you know Plus two, plus two menace is a very good ability, and when the creature dies, it creates a spirit uh, that has menace still, so you can attack with it. Although it's not a samurai anymore, so um, it won't get the bonuses from the samurai thing. But uh, it will also be pretty good in Gruel, I guess, because making it into a big threat, um, there is not too much of the uh, unconditional removal, so that's um, uh, interesting. And nice thing about it is that it, it triggers when it leaves the battlefield so um uh, even if they bounce the creature or exile it uh, you still get the or or exile the enchantment itself you still get the two two red spirit so that's that's pretty cool um i think that this is something that you drew attention under that harmonious emergence the, uh, aura that uh, makes your land into a four five um, uh, spirit uh this basically um makes it automatically modified because it has an aura on it. So that's that's something uh, uh, interesting. The problem with this archetype, I think, is that the payoffs are not super good for it. So it's going to be, you know, if the cards are good on their face value, I don't think you should like overly the synergies. You just want to create a, like a decent beatdown deck that has some incidental, um, um, incidental modified creatures or uh, possible modifications. And then if you get like extra value from the payoffs, it, it, it's fine. But if you don't, you can still like lean on a good package of creatures and removal from uh, from red and green. Yeah, like it. So yeah, these are the standout cards. Um, actually, I was... So Iron Apprentice is the interesting one also for this one because it's basically a 1-1 one -one with a counter on it and it's got more... So when it dies, um, uh, uh, you put all the counters it had on, on, on something else. Uh, so like basically a colorless version of Star Pupil, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, so that card, I think it's also pretty decent in the uh, artifact creature uh, archetype because you can sort of play on turn two, you can play the 2-2 um, uh, two -two flyer and you can play this one for freedom. So I'm, I'm, I, I guess it's a pretty neat um, uh, package. I, I, I can imagine uh, happening. Uh, the signpost uncommon is the invigorating hot springs. This is a sort of like takes on fires of Yanwaya. Uh, so basically, uh, it enters the battlefield with four plus one plus one counters as an enchantment, so it doesn't do much. Um, modified creatures you control have haste, and you can remove a counter from it and put it on something else once per turn. So basically, you can play it on turn three and pump up your uh, two drop and swing with it. And then on turn four, you can drop, uh, put a counter on it, get it gains haste. And you do it a couple of times, you generate quite a lot of modified creatures uh, for your other payoffs. Um, then there is the other way of modifying your creatures, the Tales of Master Sashiro. That's an, uh, a saga that uh, in the end produces a 5-5 five, five Vigilance haste creature. But uh, in the process of doing so, it also puts two plus one plus one counters on creatures. Um, yeah, and there's explosive entry. You can destroy an artifact, but you can also put a plus one plus one counter on one target creature. And you know, if you don't have a target for it, which probably will not be difficult to find a target, you can just use it as a two mana, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, 
Unfortunately, it's a sorcery, so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky one. And as for the payoffs, there is the Walking Skyscraper, uh, which is an 8 mana 8-8 eight, eight trampler, uh, and hexproof when it's untapped. And it costs one less to cast for each modified creature you control. So this brings me the vibe of the uh, giant from uh, uh, from Ravnica Allegiance, Ravnica, I yeah. think, um, that had the bonus for a number of gates you had in your in, in your deck. Now that one was much easier to uh, produce, and it also was a recurring threat because you could put it uh, on the top of your library if you played a gate. Uh, so this one possibly is slightly worse, but it's still an 8-8 beater in a format that doesn't have that many ways of dealing with an 8-8 beater. And at least it will survive till attacking once, and maybe you can have something to protect it once uh, once it attacks. You can. There is the one mana gives hexproofing uh, in the Agreed. format. Uh, yeah. So you can do that uh, that sort of thing. Um, Tawashi Guidebot, that card, that card is super interesting for me, how it's going to play out, uh, because it's uh, it enters on the battlefield, it puts one plus one plus one counter on target creature control, so it's a four mana, three two basically, and it has four mana and tap to draw a card, but it costs less to activate for each modified creature you control, so potentially you can uh, just tap it to draw a card at some stage of the game um, it just uh, remains to be seen how easy it is to do, and you know, once you get to that thing, you become a prime target for, which, which you know, it's not, it's not a terrible thing. Um, the card I'm keen on is the Heir of the Ancient Fang. And that's a two three for three mana, but um, it enters with a plus one plus one counter on it if I control a modified creature. So uh, I think three mana three four at, at common level, if you can reliably play it as a four on turn uh, three. That's going to be quite a beating in this format, I'm pretty sure. And um, I already talked about the Aki Amber Keeper, but this just creates you small creatures uh, every time a modified creature you control dies. And I think that this is interesting because at some stage, if you have something like the rabbit, you can put the rabbit battery on um, um, uh, on on a creature attack, and then you get a one one out of it. You can modify the one one when it dies. You don't get the uh, uh, spirit, but uh, but you still get like a decently started creature. Like you know, basically for for free you get the one one, and for one mana you make it into a two two. It, it can become a problem at some stage. For sure. Let's uh, jump to your skeleton. Yeah, I mean. Is my skeleton so great? I don't know, but uh, I put I cobbled some cards together, and 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 basically uh, I focused more on the um, equipment side of it. I have the three one drops that uh, all of them are equipment, so the rabbit battery um, and the simian sling. Um, obviously, rabbit battery seems like a better one of the two, but the simian sling is also pretty good. You can play all of those as a one drop, and then you know, deal. Two damage with them, and then later you can just start putting them on your creatures to to modify them. Um, one card that I'm quite keen to see in this uh, archetype is the uh, Jukai Trainee. And that's the two mana two two with sort of Bushido one. Uh, so whenever it gets blocked or it blocks, it gets plus one plus one. If you modify that, it it, it becomes problematic because you know uh, as a three three. If, you, if if they block it, it becomes a four four instantly. So uh, a, a, a problematic creature to deal with. Um, and then uh, I do have the heir of the ancient fangs, uh, but in this deck, uh, they basically it's very unlikely that they will come in as um, as a three mana three fours. So they might be like later plays for this deck. And I'm still uh, uh, quite curious how is like how how is that going to work with those. Uh, it's possible that maybe you want to put the signpost on common, which I didn't do in this particular build. Uh, and there's a couple of the boards, uh, which I think are like good top ends for this deck because they can make your creatures significantly bigger. So, um, um, first of all, uh, the bronze plate boar is uh, a 3 2 for 3 mana, which is not impressive. It has trample, but for 5 mana, I can put it on something and plus two and trample, I think that this is a thing that is going to well end a lot of late games um, uh, because you just put it on like a two, two, three, three, and then, uh, you know, six, five trampler. Once they deal with it, usually by double blocking, then you put it on something else. And 
and uh, the, the the whole game starts from the beginning. Um, and the Iron Hoof Boar is just like, well, you just wait till you have six mana, you play it as a 5-4 haste, uh, and this stat line, it either kills the opponent when they are not prepared for it, and if they prepare for it, they lose a lot of their own tempo, because they have things back to deal with that kind of card. So uh, I always like the, the, the card that can kill out of nowhere. And this one brings me the vibes of the cycling card from Ikoria, the 5-5 the five, five haste uh, creature. Uh, yes, sure. Because it has this uh, cheap uh, two mana, it's not cycling really, but it's a, a combat trick that plus three plus one and trample um, um, until end of turn. So you can use it in the early game if you don't look like you are going to get to six lands um, and maybe kill them earlier because of the trick. And in the late game, if you draw it and you have six mana, just slam it and 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 and. It... And then I put like a whole package of uh, removal the uh, saga that puts counters on things and uh, flips into a 5-5. Five, five. And I think I put the Twin Shot Sniper because that's just a very a good plus. feature. Yeah, A plus of a card. But I think that, you know, that there, is, there, is, there is several ways of playing this deck um, that is slightly different from this one. I think that if you want to maximize on the air of the Ancient Synergies, you might want to consider playing the 1-1 one, one, um, artifact guide that uh, has modular for it. yeah and maybe some some other cheaper things that have counters when uh, on turn two so you can reliably play it on turn three as a three four for example yeah agree hey may, may, no, so I, I agree with your assessment that the rule doesn't seem super supported um so i think we we agree there a question specifically about Simeon Sling, which is less related to Gruul, more related to Simeon Sling. So, so you mentioned this as an uh, equipment here. I have the feeling I'm a bit lower on Simeon Sling than most of the people I talked to so far. So, if you want a one mana equipment, I rather have the um, there's a the a common artifact. It costs one. It costs one to equip. I think it gives plus one plus one, and it allows the creature to tap. Sack the sword and it deals three to dark oh, creature. It doesn't, it doesn't give plus one, plus one. It's ah, just, okay. just removal. It's just removal. Okay, that 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 changes it slightly because that means it doesn't buff it, but it is equip one and it does does modify it, right? So um, yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure whether this is uh, this is this card is better than the monkey or not, but I'm just not very high on the monkey. Not sure. I think monkey monkey is pretty decent. The the plus one plus one. It's you know it's 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 probably going to sit on the battlefield uh, for the like turns three to five, but after that it will become like a pretty useful thing for your deck, especially that you don't have that much. Makes and sense. Um, as I said, I don't think that the archetype is super supported, but that I don't think that it makes it weak. Uh, I think that it's still going to be a potentially powerful color combination uh, it's just not going to be all in on the synergies it's going to be like the card quality is there to 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 do something nice and there's a couple of those cards that are really uh, decent beaters like the if you can activate them with the modified yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead jason uh, yeah i don't I don't know. I, I liked Simeon Sling a lot when it was first spoiled but like as more of the side has come out i have cooled on it a bit like, I don't, I no longer think it's, like, a top red common. I think it's probably fine, but, um, I don't know. I, I, I just am having more of a hard time imagining, like, what decks would make good use of it. Like, in red, green, like, it does, it definitely does, like, do the mo modified thing, but, like, it feels kind of small. Like, red, green, like, feels like it wants to be going bigger or something. I don't know. Yeah. And I, I don't think the one damage if it gets blocked matters a lot. And, and what I wanted to refer... So so you talked about modified not being supported. That doesn't make it weak, uh, Powell. But if if you're not going for modified, then I think Aki Ember Keeper and Air of the Asian Fang are these in your deck, right? It, it, those, those are just not playable cards if you don't reliably benefit but, from their you know, abilities that, that, that's the advantage because um if you draft correctly and you're the only uh gruel player on the on the uh, pod it means you're gonna probably see most of those yeah for, for sure for sure but i think those are also two 
cards that pretty much rely on you getting there with the modified stuff. So if yeah, that's yeah. going awkward for some reason during the draft, maybe because you aren't the only cruel drafter or somebody else is snatching up all your Jukai preservers, which they shoot, by the way, because the card is super good in other archetypes as well, then yeah, I think you're going to have a hard time. But, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, I think that yeah, maybe this is the moment for the Mark Rosewater th thoughts of the on the format. So some time ago, he had the mailbag thing. And I asked him a question uh, in that mailbag because I knew from the data that uh, in both Midnight Hunt and in um, Crimson Vow, the friendly color pairs, so, you know, white, green, green, red, black, blue, black, red, and uh, white, uh, black, blue, blue um, were more drafted than the enemy color pairs, so whatever, the, the other ones. And I asked if it was a designed thing or is it just accidental? And and his reply was very interesting in a way that he said that the current philosophy of designing limited sets uh, is that there is five color pairs that are more supported and five color pairs that are less supported. And in the case of these two sets, it was exactly what I saw in the data. So basically the friendly color pairs were the supported ones and the enemy color pairs were the less supported ones. And they never announced it, but you could still see it from the drafting frequency that people just drafted the friendly color pairs more frequently. So um, I assume that the same philosophy works in this set, but I still don't know which of the color pairs are the more supported ones, and which are the, one, the ones that are less supported. So it's going to be interesting to see it. We have, I think, some hints based on the number of multicolor rares uh, for each color pair, because some Color pairs have a lot of rares, like white red, for example, has three rares, and some have almost nothing. So, uh, um, uh, so yeah, uh, I guess that uh, yeah, you can see that. Yeah, we, see we, that, we, uh, we can look at uh, the gold cards, right? So, Demir has four, Boros has four. Um, yeah, remember, like the the gold cards in the set are really weird. Like, really there, weird. Like, <laughs> there's like a random Jeskai one and a random Mardu one, but like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think this this thing is broken in in samurai decks, by the way. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. if you can get the splash reliably, which maybe you can, these, and these are war all of a sudden uh, because why not? <laughs> these are commander plants, right? I feel these three. I assume so. Uh, okay, but yeah, you can see that in 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 multiple colors, the only multicolor card is the signpost uncommon, which is there in every one. Yeah. So I assume that these are the less supported color pairs. So we have the um, yeah blue white. Is it Gruel uh, Azorius? Yeah, I agree. Black green, whatever Golgari. Yeah, and I, I think this counts as well. But they they planted Tamio in here for story purposes. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess so. So, so I mean, you, you can see that white red has a bunch of them, and 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 um, and Ninjitsu has a bunch of them. So they are probably like the opposite sides of what is supported. Yeah. Agree, agree. Okay, yeah, cool. Fun fact. There's no is fun it fact. rare. Yeah, it's insane. There, there, there's a Jaskai rare, but there's no is it rare. Uh, okay, okay, cool, cool insight. Uh, nice, uh, nice little tidbit of uh, insightfulness there with Gru. Uh, let's move on to to Rakdos. Um, so as earlier mentioned, when we when we covered uh, Red, this is about sacrificing artifacts or artifacts. Not sure if that's going to stick, but I'm just throwing it out here. Um, a bit of a, a bit of a A and B uh, uh, archetype, right? So you, you need both the artifacts to sacrifice. So you need the fodder, and you also need uh, the sacrifice outlets. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how that works. Um, uh, and I think there are a couple of cards like Onycult Anvil, but also Sokens on Smelter, which are great in that regard because they give you an artifact back while you're also sacrificing an artifact, right? So they, they add fodder uh, to, your, uh, to, to, your, uh, to your list, basically, which is really sweet. Um, I did note that premium sack outlets are mostly uncommon. So I think those are the things that you should pick highly. Uh, there are sack outlets at common, but I think they are just less good, uh, less of a payoff. Um, and fodder- The three four looks pretty decent, no? The free four is the one that gets plus two plus one, right? If you second artifact. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so, well, 
Yeah, what what I mean with that is that that bonus is not super, right? It does it gives you plus two plus one once, and then either you benefit from that and it deals like two extra damage to your opponent, or you don't. But it's not like it, it's. Oh, a, I, I think that card is very strong. It's like, a it, cheap it, sack card. It will yeah. threaten lethal very very quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah like... If you have just like three artifacts laying around, you're threatening to attack for what nine? <laughs> if no, they don't block it, fully, fully agree. So, so let me let me repeat myself. I'm not saying the card is bad. I'm just saying that if you're trying to keep sacking stuff, that is not the way to go, right? Because you just run out of fodder. It's more like a one-off thing. You you. you sure. have... It's like a good finisher, but not it's like. It's a good finisher, piece. but it's not an ancient piece. And Unicult Anvil and Sogonson Smelter are ancient pieces. Maybe I was looking for that terminology. And then I, I added those Iron Apprentice and Ninja Kunai cards here because I wanted to talk about them a little bit with you. So Ninja Kunai is the equipment that I was referencing earlier uh, with the monkey and the construct uh, uh, Paul already talked about in Gruel as well. I was just curious, like, are these worth a piece of cardboard in your mind? Or are these just these? What do you think? Oh, I just realized, uh, you forgot to put, uh, <laughs> uh, we forgot to put Ninja's Kanai on the removal list. Conditional oh. removal. Oh, oh yes. yes! Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that is a piece of removal. But, but what do you feel about those two cards? Like, are those these? Or, or do they actually have uh, an application? Or are they just bait? I mean, Iron Apprentice seems probably good in Black Red. Like, it, it, it's what you want. The cheap artifact that, like, does something when it dies, right? Um, like, like you know, it, it's like 2-2 two, two worth of stats, kind of-ish. Sure, but we were very high on the white 1-1 one, one in Strixhaven, and we got, yeah, we got wrecked there. Well, the difference is that, like, uh, the difference is that, uh, like in Strixhaven, right? The uh, plus one plus one counter synergies and uh, just weren't really a thing. Uh, while, while here, like, there's definitely artifact synergies, right? Yeah. There's no way that we like we can have like that with Oni Cult Anvil and like Sokenzin Smelter. Like, it's definitely going to be a thing for I sure. Think. But but again, Apprentice is a one-off. It's not an ancient piece. It's just a piece of cardboard that you pay. You get one sacrifice effect, and the bonus is that you're getting the one-one counter. I'm just not sure. If that's enough, I mean, like, like Oni Cult Anvil is your engine, right? Or Sakens right. Smelter, it, like it, it is your engine. You just like, you, I, I think, I think, I think Iron Apprentice will be worth playing. Cool. Okay. Okay. And okay. you know, I mean, incidentally, you might get like an additional counter on it because of something. So. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And I, I wanted to okay. highlight that Oni Cult Can Anvil does not. Um, require you to sacrifice the artifact with the anvil itself, right? So you can use the ninja's kunai ability and get a 1-1 from the anvil, which I think is pretty yep. pretty cute to to mention. Yeah, also like for example, you can use anvil on your turn, make a 1-1, then use kunai on their turn, make another 1-1. Like it's per turn and not only on your turn and like it doesn't have any sorcery speed restrictions. Yes. I think Wait a sec, is that, is that uh, I, I've been looking at this. Whenever one or more artifacts you control leave the battlefield during your turn, create a 1-1. Oh, oh, so it is restricted. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah, they, they, yeah no, otherwise, otherwise, it would be, otherwise it would be just too bust. It would be okay, just yeah. like cat and oven one card. It's yes. not, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 yeah. yeah, it would yeah. also be way too strong, like just by itself, because like you get to like chump with the the like uh, construct token yes. and then sacrifice Second. it to drain for one. That's just like too strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, 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 no. That, 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 it could, okay. it could be okay. printed with an acorn for constructed already, uh, if that would be the case. <laughs> because <laughs> okay, but good, yeah. good to note. I, I okay. think yeah. I think it's art. And so I'm a big Rectos fan. I know you are as well, Jason. I think mostly we're the ones highlighting all the the sacrifice and steel packages and stuff like that. I I think this 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 archetype is super supported. I think there. Yeah. I think stuff like Virus Beetle is like super good. They first discard a card and then you sacrifice it to get the effect. I already mentioned Undercity Scrounger as a card that I really like. It 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 has a bit of those. Um, blue pirate vibes from Ixalan, where it's a 1-4 and it sort of brings a treasure along. Like, it doesn't actually immediately bring a treasure along, but 
it, it allows you to uh, create a treasure and the, the activate only if a creature dies this turn clause basically means that if you sacked one of your own artifacts you, you, you're able to do this as well circuit miner i think is a is an outstanding card we haven't really touched on it this stream but i think this thing slots in so many different decks and i think it slots very well in this deck as well and then then one of my <laughs> pet cards i think is the shattered states era um, and i can imagine that you like it as well jace i'm not sure huh? maybe you think it's too expensive <laughs> It's too expensive. Okay, I, I I think given that like there are sixty artifact creatures in this set, it's very likely that you steal an artifact creature and just keep your engine well, going. Yeah, but, like the, the thing is, you don't want just want to steal like any random creature from your opponent. You want to steal their best creature and sack it. And like so, sometimes they their best creature is not going to be an artifact. I think in fact most of the time their best creature is not going to be an artifact. And also like I don't know. There, the, there's not that many sack outlets. Like, like you really want to free, like especially when this is five mana, you really want a free sack outlet, and there's like really aren't that many. The gold card is basically, I think it's this thing. The gold card is the only one. Yeah, that, that's the gold card is free, but it uh, is restricted to artifacts. Steelbreaker is only one mana, but it's only restricted. It's restricted to artifacts. You have like a couple two mana sack outlets with. Dockside Chef and the uh, the like Saka thing draw two, and like those aren't restricted, but also they cost two mana. It's like I don't know. Uh, yes, okay, the rare black vehicle can sack things. That that is a true statement, but like it's it's going to be hard. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. But I, I, I've and, seen this know, card being written off, and I, I don't think that's the case. That's that's what I'm throwing I out think that, there. You know, the, 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 there is there there is the fact that it turns into a creature at some stage that, um, yeah, that should be taken into account. I mean, it's like dominating vampire was not really like a steal and suck. It was more like, oh, I can steal something, slam with it, and whatever, I still get a creature out of it. The deal, and and this is the same, arguably a bit slower, but uh, whatever. Sure, but the thing is, usually with active treason effects, you want to like win immediately, right? And like. If you do that, you're not getting the rest of the saga. <laughs> like, uh, either you play your active treason effect like at a more awkward time where you're not winning immediately, or like it's just more expensive and like the rest of it isn't that useful. Yeah, I, 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 I've, I've heard that sentiment and I, I don't disagree with it because it's pretty factful, right? But I, I do think that a, a, a simple steel effect can be dead a lot of the times, and this is never a dead card, right? This is just a uh, a, a, a slowed version of a 3-3 but you're getting a 3-3 eventually Just... um, and you know with Dockside Chef 7 mana for Steel and Sack is 1 mana above the rate and you will get that creature in the end So yeah yeah, and it's not just Steel Sack, it's also draw a card but hey, hey, let's let's see let's jump into the archetype I'll bring up the the sealed deck dot tag. So yeah, I, I think we've went over most of the cards here. Uh, I think um, if you're going for the real like artifact heavy deck where you were trying to play a, a reactor, I think Ronin is super solid because you can have it enter the battlefield a couple of times, generate multiple counters on the on the reactor, which I think is a, a nice one two combo at uh, at uncommon. All the cards that I included here that we haven't really mentioned yet. Uh, one of them is Papercraft Decoy. I'm not very sure about this card, but it's another artifact creature, 2 mana 2 1. And instead of being a 1 1 that puts its counter somewhere else, you can, you can uh, uh, when it leaves the battlefield, so when you sacrifice it, you can pay an additional 2 to draw a card. I think that's uh, a nice uh, little sack outlet piece if you're not really getting there with other stuff. Uh, I included double Scrounger because I'm a big fan. Uh, Yamazaki, the general is here that we mentioned when we were discussing red. red. Um, so in, when you attack with it alone, you may cast target artifact or uh, um, target artifact card from your graveyard this turn. Super solid, I think, in a deck that has a lot of artifacts. Uh, double Kami is here. I think if you're playing a lot of artifacts, then how sweet is it to get one of those back? I think just playing Kami as a 5 mana 3-6 returning a virus beetle making your opponent discard then sacking the beetle before the kami trigger uh sacrifice it i think it's just like stuff like that is super solid 
that can release well, you. Uh, you can take just, but like that, that. To be clear, that does require a lot of setup. You, you, need, you do need to have like a sack outlet and a beetle in your graveyard. One hundred percent. Like m most of the lines I'm talking about, I'm assuming I have an anvil on the board, right? That's that's. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the the hypothetical freedom I'm uh, I'm allowing myself here. Yeah, I think we are talking about bringing artifacts back to the battlefield. I think stuff like Iron Hoof Boar is super solid. It it has haste, so I think in that sense, um, it's it's a nice one. Unfortunately, it doesn't have mana value three or less. But I thought there was another card that got an artifact out of the grave here. I'm not sure uh, which one it was. Um, I mean, I think there's like a five mana reanimate or something. Oh yes, the black one. I don't have it in here, but uh, I, I like the the modality on Iron Iron Hoof Boar. I think one and a red plus three plus one trample is just a solid combat trick. And as Pavel already mentioned, five four trample haste is just nice. Yeah, that's um, that's Rakdos for me. What, so what do you what do you think of the three mana deal two damage to a target and one to everything that opponent controls with the you're already dead as a combo interesting wait wait what help me out here okay so, so uh seismic wave i believe it's three mana instant deal two damage to any target one damage to each creature your opponent controls that is not an artifact yes um so you know, you know you'll have a bunch of one damage on stuff and then cast you are already dead oh yes on one of those damage things super sweet i think you are already dead in general is a super sweet card right you chum block somebody something with a furious beetle and then you you already dead it I, I think oh yeah so it's certainly i think you're already dead is probably like has its home in black red yes i think it's uh... yeah, it's basically blade brand and blade brand was historically a ragdos card yeah super super sold card agree agree okay let's uh bring up the slideshow jason boros fan favorite yeah, so one of the weird things about Boros this set is I think it's not that aggressive. Uh, or like, not not like purely aggressive. Like, you definitely want to attack. That's this whole mechanic, is attacking. But it wants you to, to attack alone. And also a lot of the payoffs for attacking alone are value-based and not like, uh, like, do more damage, right? So, um, I, I think the ways you want to leverage this then are like, uh, one having an evasive creature that can like repeatedly attack alone. So like, well, it has to be a warrior or a samurai. But like, a perfect one for this is Mothra Ritual. There's one man and one one flyer. That's a warrior. Has types. You can tap stuff in the late game, or you can just like attack with it alone and uh, uh, repeatedly get your triggers. Uh, the second way is attrition. Uh, you can have like a bunch of two two white samurais from. For example, Imperial Oath, uh, that you like repeatedly send one in. Like, like think of like the Kaldheim red white equipment deck, uh, just like repeatedly suiting up one creature at a time, sending it in, uh, and, and like you know making favorable trades. Um, that, that's what you'd want to do with something like Imperial Oath in this deck. Uh, you like have your two two get some buffs maybe uh, like like a few and, and then like get some value with your pay other payoff cards and trade off and just like accrue value that way and of course value Th things like tempered in solitude which uh, literally draws you cards when you fulfill the requirement or, or like the two legendary creatures the Yamazaki siblings uh, that uh, rebuy stuff from your graveyard when you attack alone. So yeah, uh, in, in terms of like enablers, uh, like I said, Moth Rider Patrol, great one. Imperial Oath, if you uh, can also do this with like just providing a bunch of like stalling out the board so that you can afford to attack alone, and then providing a bunch of like stuff that you you can even like sometimes s send in a chump attack with a two two, and like uh, there can uh, you can leverage this with like combat tricks or other things to like blow your opponent out, uh, blow your opponent out. Uh, there's also the Saga. I don't know how good this will be. I, it might be decent, but it also might be a bit clunky. It's like four mana. The first two chapters uh, jump a creature into the air and give it plus one, plus one. It's just like another way to like get a flyer that's attacking alone every turn. 
um, and like the backside's a flyer, like a two four flyer or something. But uh, it's not a warrior or samurai, I believe, unfortunately. So it doesn't work uh, with your triggers generally. But uh, so the payoffs, um, uh, in terms of like power toughness boosts. There's uh, Iganjo Exemplar, which is just like plus one plus one exalted. It's I think that it's actually a pretty solid creature. Like uh, imagine like playing the one one fly on one and then playing this on two. You attack with a two two next turn. The, the turn after that you could attack with uh, the Exemplar as a three two or like play a second Exemplar and attack with Exemplar as a four three. Like they can get pretty good in multiples. Um, the only awkward part is that like 2-1 isn't a great body especially on blocks and like that could be kind of awkward when you're trying to when, when you're not like being all out aggressive I, so we'll have to see how that plays out another one that i really like is peerless samurai uh it's a 2-3 menace for three um and when it attacks a, when a samurai or a warrior attacks alone uh your next spell this turn gets reduced by one um uh and Specifically, I'm looking at that in combination with Imperial Oath, or like uh, there's the Sunblade Samurai, the 5 mana 4 4 with like uh, plain cycling basically for two the, that we talked about earlier. Um, so it, it just like lets you get to those powerful spells earlier, and I think you do want to uh, be getting to those expensive spells. I don't think Red White is often going to be like a low uh, curve out and like beat them down deck. Uh, and also, of course, this, this having menace makes it attack alone pretty easily. Uh, and sometimes, like sometimes, like they're not gonna have good luck for two, three menace. And if they try to, you can maybe blow them out. Um, and also, two, three as a body, honestly, I think is probably better than three, two here. Like even though, uh, even though, like you know, you can make fun of like, oh, two, these two, three menaces are usually better than, uh, sorry, usually worse than three, two menaces when you're trying to also block which i think this deck is trying to do it can be uh it can be a better body if you like want to also block and just like be able to attack with one creature at a time um and like selfless samurai is another really busted one when when something attacks yeah. alone it gets lifelink yeah uh, yeah um oh another thing that uh i heard sam black pointing out on his stream last night was that uh when your when your archetype so usually like you know in an in an archetype about attacking you want a lot of creatures right but when you're something like this version of red white where you want to attack with one creature every turn you don't actually need that as many creatures as usual and you actually want to play more removal spells than usual so that you you're, you you can like keep getting your creatures through so like again that points more towards this uh deck being more mid-rangey less like all-out aggro so what what do you think about the plus one plus oh first strike combat trick? Because I think that this is the home for it, really, no? Uh, yeah, maybe. So, okay, I think it is... So, okay, so there's some awkward things with it. First of all, I think a lot of the cards that you want to be attacking alone with, you kind of, like, already... You want them to, like, kind of go unblocked. Uh, like they are you like for example the um the one one flyer or like the two three menace right uh if you the, the those are like my main thoughts for what's enabling this attack alone thing or, or like or just like chump attacking with a two two samurai and like plus one plus so first strike doesn't actually play that well with any of them like with the flyer like it's probably not being blocked anyways uh and like even if it is it's really hard for like uh, two one first strike to get there, or like a three two first strike, even sometimes. Uh, with like with the two three menace, you're like completely losing out on its trigger if you use the combat trick because like the combat trick costs one mana and like you know you know yeah that spell like, costing one less to cast does not do anything unfortunately. Uh, and also like it, it definitely can blow out some combats if you do that like if they block with two two ones then, like, they get absolutely wrecked. Uh, but I don't know. I, I think plus one, plus oh, first strike has not impressed recently. Let me let me throw another card at you, because 
A card that I really like in this archetype is the one and a white deal four to target attacking or blocking creature. I think typically those cards aren't oh, yeah. great. Those aren't great in Boros because normally you're you're attacking, right? And if they already blocked and then you kill it and blah, blah, blah. We, we know the story of why that card isn't great normally. But I think in this type of Boros deck, it's super good, right? Because they are very incentivized to multi-block the one creature you're attacking with. But because... Most likely it will be rather large or buffed up or have menace. And then being able to like take out one of those, I think is super good. And your oh, yeah, and I, I, agree. I yeah, and I really like your peerless samurai argument with the uh, with the one and the red uh, the, the red mana trick. But that mana is leveraged if you use the the removal spell that I'm describing. So yeah, super solid. Yeah, and I completely agree with Clarm in chat. Like attacks are you like you you ideally want your attacks to be like either unblocked or like you don't actually care if they block and trade off. Um, uh, like I, I don't think you're going to be attacking with your Asari captain very yeah uh, like uh, it, 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 into a situation where it's blocked that much. <laughs> yeah. Mm. No, I agree. And I, what's funny is initially I I missed a bit on the the second option in Clarm's text message where he said a text with fodder right so when you first pitched imperial oath as one of the best uh, white commons in the set i was like is he leaning on the uncommon gold card that hard that he wants like multiple summarize to to add more power to it but then later on i realized no he just wants all his actual summarize to look at that two to vigilance token and be like hey dude you're next, right? That that's how you want to apply those two two tokens. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and, and I, I missed on that initially, but well, after talking about it a bit more, I think yeah, that's super cool. Like all the actual samurai cards standing there, like okay, there's this line of two twos just waiting to get slaughtered. Yeah, <laughs> I well, like. But I, like I, I still think that you know having the uh, signpost uncommon does help to make those two twos into a must yeah. block. And, oh, uh, sure, yeah, like, yeah, 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 for sure. I, I think so. The signpost uncommon is really weird because it doesn't have great stats itself, right? Like it's a five and a four three, that, and also especially it does not block well at all. <laughs> yeah, uh, w which is kind of not great for the kind of like thing i'm describing and you also it doesn't attack well either by itself but if you do pair it with imperial oath like if you the, the problem is that's kind of slow but if you can get to him into a board state where you're just like sending in a 2-2 samurai every turn that becomes like a 6-2 or something that's really powerful so i don't know how to feel about it but yeah i think that exactly this is the thing that the befriending the moths i think is going to be sizably better in decks that do have a couple of the four threes basically oh yeah for sure for sure yeah yeah befriending the mods i'm 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 really curious to see if that's indeed a card you want because you yeah well you you make your creature fly and 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 allow it to get over your opponent or whether four mana for that effect twice is just too much because as you mentioned that the two four mods on the backside is not even a samurai so it doesn't work in the deck because but it's a big butt. It's a big butt, sure, but you can't attack with it in the air because you want your samurai to be your only attacker, right? So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a blood there, I would say. Uh, Explode thing asks asks about equipment. Um, I mean, uh, there like I said, there aren't that many samurai that like buff your power and toughness. So like, I think you do actually want some equipment. Like I think ancestral katana. Uh, it might be, or is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The... one in a white, and the equipment is one if it's... you attack alone. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. That's, it's like that's super. I think that's like, I think that would be very good with like the imperial, the imperial oath or moth rider patrol, or like, like I think it's just going to be very good in red white. Yeah. Um, like, well, okay, sorry. When I say very good, I mean that like. The ex the expectation on that card is that it looks kind of clunky, but I think it'll be better than that in re red white. Um, I don't think you want to take it like super highly, but I think it'll be a good piece of the puzzle in like being able to enable attacking with one thing. Uh, also, looking at my archetype skeleton, um, let's let's, so let's move to that actually. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Shall uh, I, uh, I bring think, it up? Give me a sec. Yeah, I think generally I would put more removal in this deck. Um, 
Like, I, I think ideally you'd want just like more removal, less like, like I don't think you want Kindled Fury. Thinking about it more. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I, I off, off the bat, I have one question about the creature that I'm also like completely not having decided whether it's great or terrible in this archetype, but um, <laughs> uh, it's the Seven Tail Mentor. Oh. It's the four mana two three okay. that when it enters the battlefield or dies, put a plus one plus one counter on the creature or vehicle you control. Because I think that this is a perfect example of your chump attack creature that brings value, and they will really have to think hard about blocking it because you got the value from uh, from it dying, basically. Yeah, I mean, I think that card is like just like generic, a bit of generic value. I don't think it gets that much better in this deck. I'm I'm not convinced on it. Uh, like we've seen uh, Gavney Silversmith, right? Like two man, four mana, two three. Uh, put two plus one plus one counters on uh, on thing like put uh, distribute two counters when it enters, and like that was fine uh, in Midnight Hunt. Um, but it it couldn't put counters on itself, which was a big issue there. Uh, or no, no, Silversmith could. Oh yeah, right? no, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. So th this one, the big difference is that it uh gets a counter when the second counter comes when it dies, which is much worse. Like, uh, but. Yeah, I'm not sure how to feel about that card. It's probably going to be fine. It's probably not going to be like busted. It's probably not going to be horrible. I don't know. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, how do you feel about um, about trample in this kind of deck, right? So um, I've I've been thinking about. Let, let me bring up the the removal spell quickly to deal four because I think it's super solid here. It's this one, the the wandering intervention. That's the one we were talking about earlier. Uh, the, the, what do you think of the boar? Just to have one of your deck. Do, do you think that's a thing? Because you're attacking with like one big creature, especially if you have the the uncommon out, you can imagine that creature having like six power. I don't think that's strange to have. And so then... maybe. But but another my one of my problems with the boar is that like it's not a samurai or a warrior. Like it doesn't have those types. It's not and a samurai also... boar, which is a disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and also, like, I think you're already spending, uh, you're already want to, like, play, it, like, gets lots of value from other places and have a lot of other places to put your mana, so I'm not sure whether you'll have the mana to re-equip it, but it certainly could do that thing. Oh, wait, just, we're like, talking about just... different boars. So I was, talking uh, wait, about, I was talking about the one that had the combat trick on channel. And, oh, and you were uh, talking about uh, the the other boar. It's just very nice that they're both boars. That's not to make yeah, it any I more mean, confusing. That's a three drop, like, right? Bronze big boar. Yeah. You were talking about the big boar. He was talking about the small. Yes, I, I, I think the big boar will be fine too. Like it, I, it's. I think I like it better as a combat trick than the plus one plus out first strike. I'm, I'm pretty sure big big boar. Can it be bounced back with the uh, brother Yamazashi, whatever? I mean, if you attack with, uh, yeah, if you attack with the red uh, Yamazaki, you can yeah, yeah. replay the boar. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think that that's like a sort of small combo, no? Yeah. Uh, so you so. can't you can't channel it, but you can replay it. You can replay the Tremble Haster. Yeah. Makes sense. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I when I think of Exalted and I think of this one big creature attacking, like I I just wish that it had Trample, right? To prevent them from saying like, okay, here you have my one-one spirit. Um, uh, let's let's go to my turn. That's just um, yeah. Couldn't help but thinking about how to give it trample, basically. And I, I think bronze blade boar is too expensive, as you said. Uh, in configure five is just insanely expensive. So that's why I, I thought about the iron hoof boar. Well, you know, we're talking about a deck with two Imperial Oaths. I think that it plans to get to five mana. That is true. That is true. Okay. Any more thoughts on Boris, uh, Jason, uh, Powell? I, I, I'm looking forward to trying to figure... I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be several builds of it. And one is going to be like super aggressive and the other one is going to be um, what Jason is showing here. And I don't know, possibly there will be like good versions of both of them and probably nothing in the middle. Makes sense. Makes sense. Gurk asked a question about Boros that we can maybe cover quickly. 
does the Peerless Samurai reduce the cost of channel abilities? Yeah, it does not reduce channel. It only reduces spells. Yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, Explode. Thanks for answering that as well. Okay, let's dive into the next one. Azorius. Vehicles and pilots. Oh, that's one of mine, is it? It is. It is. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Well, I mean, <laughs> what it says on the tin, it has vehicles and pilots. <laughs> Basically, pilot being creatures that have low power but can crew above their uh, uh, their weight. So uh, I think that pilots in this uh, format, they can crew two more than they have attack, and that allows them to uh, crew uh, quite chunky um, uh, vehicles with crew three, let's say. So... Um, I think it's the one of the less supported um, archetypes in the format. So it's going to be interesting to see if it ever comes together or do you have to open some rares and maybe based on that or maybe you uh, build some kind of a three-color concoction that uh, gets the artifact synergies plus some pilots uh, on the splash or something. Um, so I assume that you wrote this part, uh, Sander. Yeah, I did. I did. Feel free the, to... The classic problem of it is that it is an A plus B deck that requires to draw the things in the right order. And those decks usually have problems with being reproducibly good because you will have games when you draw like five useless pilots and no, um, uh, and no vehicles. And there will be games where you draw like five vehicles and nothing to crew them. So um, uh, it makes it... Tricky to construct, and even if you construct them well, you still might run into trouble. Um, but there are some good vehicles, so maybe you will just play this sort of Azorius good stuff that has slight leaning on some of the synergies, but doesn't go all in on them, for example. Yeah, for sure. I think we can go to the uh, skeleton. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, you oh. have the silly. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. no, that's fine, that's fine. I, so I wanted to add one, one thing, and that's that... What what I liked about the vehicles in this set that, that there are two common ones that have crew one, which makes uh, the one one spirit tokens and stuff pretty good crewers, and also the yeah, uh, the definitely. one one enchantment doggo the draws a card stuff like that. Being able to crew a vehicle with that is pretty solid game, right? So you can play the one one doggo on two, then play the three two flying vehicle on three, and then you have a three two attacker on turn four. I think, well, that's. That's better than nothing, is what I'm trying to say, right? I mean, uh, it could have crew two or core three, and then the doko would be useless. But I think, due to the crew one, um, yeah, there's there's stuff that you can do with those uh, throwaway bodies still, which I like. Yeah, but and okay, so basically we have the pilots, and um, the Kitsuna Ace is actually not getting the bonus for the power uh, uh, when you get it, but it does something else whenever it attacks. Uh, it either gets first strike or you untap the 2-2, which means that probably like 99% of the time you'll just give first strike to your 4-3 uh, that you crewed for one. Um, you have suit up, which sort of can convert, well, can activate vehicle without a pilot, uh, exactly. but it also can make a small pilot into something big and you draw a car, so uh, it's pretty useful. And Born to Drive, I think that this card is like especially important if you're if you if you want to go into this archetype, I'm pretty sure that you want to have a couple of those. Uh, that basically uh, has a channel that makes two one one uh, colorless pilot creatures, and they can crew free basically each of them. Uh, so you can play those like bigger things, like the futurist sentinel, the the four mana six six. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that this card is important. Nice part about the signpost uncommon is that uh, well, it's three mana three four. Um, a vehicle, and whenever one or more vehicles you control attack, create a 1-1 one, one pilot that can also have this crew 3 uh, ability. So basically, if you manage to crew it once, which shouldn't be terrible, or crew something else once, you get a creature out of it, which is a good deal, and also that creature is very good at crewing things. So um, uh, it's a self-contained uh, engine that basically can propel itself. Um, they will have a problem with removing all the pilots because you just generate one every turn. And the nice part, it doesn't have to attack itself. So uh, you can play like a one drop, a two mana uh, crew one um, um, vehicle, like the high speed hover bike, play the prodigy's prototype on turn three, crew the two, two flyer, attack with it, get another one, one, and then sort of like start uh, uh, rolling it. It's a bit of a fantasy fairyland, but um, that's fine. Um, 
And yeah, okay, I think that Mac, Mac Titan Core is an interesting build around because I think that it's going to be more of a build around than the, a staple as it is a rare, so you can't count on it. But with this one, you can put all the, you know, 1-1 one, one artifact creatures and you can Voltronize them into this ma magnificent 10-10 ten, ten lifelink flying whatever vigilance based uh, thing that will probably end the game. So you will have a couple of those Azorius decks that just basically are building towards the Mech Titan core and uh, and and try to Voltronize it and uh, yeah yeah I I, like I, cool I saw building. I saw certain card preview streams where they forgot that Mech Titan core you need to exile creatures or vehicles um, <laughs> instead of just random artifacts so so in their in their review this card might also fit in like. Rakdos or something, but I think it's really a, a Azorius, um, Azorius build around where you have enough yeah, artifact, creatures. Artifact, creatures, yes, way, artifact, artifact creatures. Yes, artifact creatures. And, and, and oh, yeah, and like for instance, the 1 1 flyer becomes very good in the yes. uh, blue one. Yes. Not the white one, the blue one. Yeah. Which is another nice thing that you can cannibalize the bloody ninja and uh, steal their 1 1 flyer so that they cannot have fun. <laughs> yep. Explode Please things. don't do it when I draft ninjas. Explode Tanks is making a good point that if they uh, if, if that they somehow remove the, the Mac Titan on the trigger, you lose all the cards. That is definitely a way how that is going to punish you. Majorly, I'm looking forward to the first clips where that happens to someone. And and uh, something I wanted to add on Katsuni Ace, um, uh, Powell, you mentioned that it will most of the time gain first strike, but what I, li what I like about the Ace is, so what I can imagine in this deck is that you'll have multiple vehicles and two little creatures, right? That's how I imagine this deck going wrong in most games and what ace then does it allows you to attack with one vehicle and then block with one vehicle as well which i like that is true yeah yeah so that i like that about the card want to go into your uh, skeleton do i boy do, do i <laughs> boy do i here you go no option okay, to, so to now, now i know i'm on this now i know i'm on this slide i can i can actually go to to to, to my to my version of it so i have i'm blind <laughs> I need it on a big screen and not in the stream quality, which has some pixelations. Um, Is it just me or did we lose? That? What did we lose, Jason? Wait, uh, do I have the bad connection or does... Oh, okay, I have the bad connection. <laughs> okay, you might have back. So, yeah, um, basically I put a bunch of one drops with one power. So I put, oh, well, actually Hotshot Mechanic has two power and for the, for the, for the uh, sake of crewing, it has actually four power. And then I didn't really go super deep on the, um, on the uh, vehicles. I put uh, several of them. So I, I put like, uh, well, actually one, two, three, four, five. And I think one top end and, oh no, six, six, six seven, seven of them. Yeah, you have, a, you have quite, a lot. quite a reasonable amount here, to be honest, uh, Sugarfeach. But, um, you know, I mean, uh, there is an uncommon one. Uh, oh no, I put a bunch of them. Um, they are, uh, so I, I think that like, th this is the closest and, you know, uh, it, it, it goes to with the theme of Azorius every, every time. A uh, bunch of them have flying, and I basically uh, planned this deck to be a sort of like uh, blue skies, planes, planes, um, Azorius planes. Uh, when all my one ones for one mana have flying, uh, I have the dragonfly suits, which is the three two flyer for three mana um, uh, um, creature. Um, I get Mobilizer Mac, which is also um, a flying um, uh, vehicle, and and you know it does require Crew Three. But uh, I think that having uh, Born to Drive, having the Hotshot mechanic, I can actually generate that three power from uh, from a significantly less uh, power, and it also can uh, do some weird tricks like um, activating other uh, crew costs to uh, to sort of pay for that um, uh, pay for that. Uh, uh investment in in activating it uh because i have so much uh vehicle i also put the patchwork automaton so i basically can increase the size of that thing and that can became become um, a threat on its own or something that blocks uh, well uh, later in the game 
I think one cute combo that you can do, and I, I put it just as an example of what you can do with uh, with some of those uh, uh, reconfigure things. I put the acquisition octopus because in my head, I can sort of tap the octopus to, let's say, activate the dragonfly suit. Then I can pay two mana to uh, equip with the octopus. Then I attack with the dragonfly suit um, and uh, draw a card. And basically at the end of the turn, it will fall off so I can repeat the same process the next turn, basically. So I regain the creature that I turned into equipment uh, for free, basically, because normally you would have to reconfigure it again to get it into the creature again. So next turn I can use it still to crew and that will work with every reconfigure card that I get. Uh, and yeah, no, I mean, the idea is just basically to try to play as many creatures that you can and protect them somehow and from dying and, 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 and use through uh, the machines. I think that the instant problem I have with this deck that I built uh, is uh, probably not enough creatures in it. Uh, so I would probably have to trim some of those um, uh, more expensive vehicles and, and, and put some bunch of things like, for example, uh, after, after looking at the skeletons of uh, Jason, I think that the one one that brings a one one with it is perfect if you have a bunch of one crew uh, uh, vehicles. So I think that would be an important card there. B bringing two bodies is giving you a bit more uh, resilience to to re removal, so you can always have pilots. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with your uh, uh, low on creature assessment, and I, I really like your point about uh, the reconfigure. I think the the thing you described really works well with with cheap reconfigure costs like this one having two. I think that's super solid. Go. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, I also put another flyer because I think, yeah, the general plan should be that you probably should race in the air. And this is partially enabled in this format because your um, creatures are quite cheap for a normal Skies deck. Like the Dragonfly suit, if you have multiples of that and you can generate some one ones to crew them, uh, they will kill very quickly. I mean, anyone that uh, had to deal with the quickly resolved Delver knows how, how what a clock is that um, when you uh, when you can't deal with it. And as I said, not much flying in this format, so uh, those three twos will can do probably quite a lot of work. Yeah, and then Explode Things me mentions that the creature count is misleading a bit, and I agree. Yeah, stuff like Born to Drive um, and Behold the Unspeakable. Uh, create a creature and i think that's with most sagas the case right so something like era of enlightenment also generates yeah a, but probably uh, you want to you want to have those creatures in the first two turns and then you might want to bring the vehicles but as i said i think that this format the, this archetype is not supported sufficiently that you have to lean heavily on the synergy within it uh get them when you can but you don't have to like build like a dedicated vehicle deck i just basically when i build the skeletons in my first uh, try I try to, you know, do the thing that uh, Wizards wants you to do, but what Wizard wants you to do uh, is not always what you should be doing in order to maximize your win rate. So I think that in this case, not necessarily is going to be the case. So uh, maybe you want to do something else with this deck and uh, use the vehicles as sort of like a support theme rather than the main dish. Yeah. What? What? So. So. I take something away from every skeleton, right? That either you or Jason uh, uh, built. And what I, what I took away from this is that how prevalent flying is in this deck. I, I didn't notice that initially, but when I looked at your uh, Artu build, I, I noticed that immediately. Like, so yeah, totally agree with that. Azorius is a flyers deck yet again, and and yeah, uh, and then you know uh, because again that this is the one reason I put the acquisition octopus is that because it's a flying deck the acquisition becomes way better because you can much easier uh you know squeeze through a flyer and, and draw the card so yeah for sure for sure cool so kogari was an interesting skeleton because i think uh like an hour or two before the stream none of us build it yet if i'm not mistaken and i think that has a lot to do with how unsupported it is and that makes i think it, it less attractive to, to build. I think Golgari is another one of those the green season of renewal package plus a color type decks. At least that's how I've built the deck. Um yeah it's it's the the green channel cards plus the black um uh mill mill yourself and 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 yeah sack folder type cards 
allow you to fill your graveyard quicker than any other archetype, I would say. Which makes cards like Season of Renewal, Kami of Restless Shadows, uh, Okiba Salvage, and Unforgiving One, uh, who all leverage your graveyard in some form of way. I think those cards are best at home in, uh, in Golgari. So uh, let's let's quickly dive into the the skeleton that I eventually came up with. Um, yeah, and I, I think as I said, uh, so a lot of the green package that Jason showed you at the beginning of the stream is again here, Fang of Shagony and the Bamboo Grove Archer to to stay alive early. Um, the Seasons of Renewals, I got two of those. Careful Cultivation, the the super solid channel card that creates the one one. I got double Juke Preserver here and double Tanuki. So this this green channel package, I think again it's uh, it's it's very important for this archetype. Um, other things I noticed when when I was building this is that there is a a little ninja sub package if you get the right card. So there are a couple of uh, ninjas. So the the Shigegi is a ninja. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct. Uh, the Stalker two drop is a ninja. And there's also a uh, Kappa Tech Wrecker. Let me bring it up. For some reason I can't really bring it up. Oh, here it is. Which is also a ninja. So there are a couple of, of ninjas. So there is some synergy in Black Green uh, with Ninjitsu, um, which might come up if you, uh, again, get the right uh, uncommons and maybe even the right rares. I included Springleaf Avenger to highlight that little, uh, little synergy package. It says whenever it deals combat damage to a player, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. So again, it fits that graveyard team. Nothing else really to add here. I think we talked a lot about the green package that I'm including and none of the black cards that I added really matter for this archetype. Anything you guys want to add, Paul and Jason? Anything else you figured out about this color pair? So my, my only thought about this archetype is that I probably will end the format never drafting it. <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't know. I, I think, I, I look at this color pair and just think, oh, this is just green. <laughs> right. <laughs> watching yeah. black. You, you, you... Like, I, I, think, I think I'll draft it in the, for, in the sense that I'll draft green and I'll want to put some black cards in my deck. Maybe, probably. Right, I think... Yeah, but, but you're moves... a degenerate. You, you draft, like, probably five times more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. I don't yeah. know. I think it's probably fine. Yeah. I, I think Gloom Shrieker, the, the Golden Common, is super solid, right? 2 1 mana's body that gets you a good a card out of your graveyard. I think that's that's super solid. So yeah, yeah. that would be a reason to either at least splash black or move into green black. If you uh, are mm -hmm. able to pick up one or two or those. Sort of sort of yes and sort of no, because I I think that there is a case for it losing a bit the body losing a bit the relevance when you want to play it really but you know i mean still good yeah i think you'll be able to fill up your graveyard quickly enough with stuff like careful cultivation for example on turn two that you're able to even if you play gloom freaker on three have something to return okay yeah that, that's fair Gurg asks, um, it has a lot more two drops than the Boris Skeleton. Is it more aggressive? No, no. I, 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 my answer to that would, uh, would be no, uh, Kirk. I don't think so. I think the two drops here are mostly here to stay alive. Um, that's one thing. I, I wouldn't um, mark this archetype as being aggressive, but it, it attacks on a different angle. I think you will attack with multiple creatures more often with this than with your average Boros deck. Double exposure, I just want to need you to with the gold card. Yeah, that's sweet. And Moses asks what's happening on the three drop slot. Well, as, as we talked about earlier on the stream, stuff like careful cultivation. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not on the... I'm not in the um, uh, seal deck uh, view anymore, but careful cultivation is basically a two drop. So these two careful cultivations, you can put those in the two drop slot. And then I think the three drop slot looks rather normal. Yeah, what Clarm says in the chat. Okay, wanna move on? Let's go for Celestia. Uh, actually, can we, can, uh, 
Paul, can you do uh, Demir first? I need to take care of something work-wise. Sorry. Yeah, no, sure, sure. No worries. Demir it is, Paul. Okay, well, Demir is all about ninjas. Um, so I assume that uh, the, the plan is A, be on the board early because your ninjas are going to be cheaper if you have an early drop. So like one drops are essential. And especially I think that the one one flyer is uh, super essential. Um, yeah, the only, yeah, the only tidbit I added here, uh, Powell, to help you out is that I'm really interested in ninjitsuing back the Animus so that you can replay the long reach of night. This might be a long reach, but uh, I, I think it's cool. <laughs> let's, let's jump towards this slide. Right. So, um, as you said, evasiveness. Like, Network Disruptor is an amazing uh, um, evasive creature because, like, let's look at it from the perspective of playing ninjas, which means that you want to play it on turn one, then you can attack and uh, ninja something, most likely ninja something in um, on turn two because you have plenty of ninjutsu two creatures or ninjutsu one creatures. And then actually you can probably play it on turn three, tap the blocker, and then you can have an unopposed your uh, ninja again. And especially if that brings you some kind of a, um, uh, some kind of a, uh, what's the name? Um, uh, value effect, um, uh, you're going to get it second time just just for the sake of re re replaying the network disruptor. And then next turn you can attack again, bring back the disruptor yet again, and, and you're getting like a lot of tempo value in, in the way that your creatures basically have um, unblockable. So uh, that, that's the cool part of it. Um, so you put Cloying Torment, I assume that this is the way of uh, removing something or um, uh, 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 squeezing through your things. Yeah, actually like thing actually, it has the text that the creature you put it on can't block. So it removes oh, yeah, a yeah, yeah. blocker yeah. on the other. So it's not only making the blocker smaller yeah, or yeah, killing yeah. it, it's also preventing it from blocking, which and is a form... you don't care about... It, it yeah. slows down their clock as well and, and speeds up your clock quite significantly. So this might be like a tempo play in the in the demir deck uh, i agree with that oh, huh. i didn't realize that it said can't block I, I thought it was just like give it minus one minus one no no no. it actually has that text so i'm not saying that, it's a good card in the mirror yeah I, i'm not saying it's a good card but i think it works in this archetype because you want them to not block basically yeah no i think that you know you take one damage less from it because you can't um, uh, block so it will start attacking you um you drain them Oh, no, they, you, well, you basically drain them for one. Not yeah. drain them, you, you, they lose one life uh, every turn. So that's also something good because it speeds up your clock a bit. So yeah, that might be quite quite useful in, the, in this kind of um, uh, archetype. Right, it's so, three minor effects that I think makes it a solid card in this archetype. That's... Yeah. I'm not saying put so five think, here deck. Sorry, sorry, yeah. now go ahead. I, I, I will shut up. <laughs> so go in, ahead. in general, I, th I think that the, the problem with this deck is that the uh, creatures are relatively small. And that's why probably you want to be on the board pretty early because you need to do a whole lot of attacking uh, to get through. That's why I'm 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 pretty stoked about the five five because I think that if you can ninjutsu it for four, now that that's a turn. You know, if you can do it on turn three, that's that's a solid turn. And if, I think you can when you have the uh, ninja that makes a treasure, you can actually uh, uh, try to do it basically on turn three, and then um, and then you present like a super fast clock and. There is not so many ways you can deal with the five-five uh, creature uh, so early in this format. So I'm 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 pretty stoked to try to do that kind of stuff. And yeah, we can move to my probably very deficient, um, uh, my 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 very very deficient ninja deck. Uh, I need to open it so I can actually see it better because, again. My eyes, not so great. Okay, divide by CMC. So, um, as you can see, I put two network disruptors because that was the maximum I could put. Um, I think that this card is just uh, the glue for this particular deck, and uh, you really want to prioritize them quite highly, probably higher than anything else in this deck. Um, then we have a bunch of uh, uh, ninjas. We have the... Uh, um, we have the Master Splinter, who 
does have ninjutsu technically, but uh, you probably just want to play it as a um, uh, a two mana two two that uh, makes your stuff bigger. Uh, it it makes uh, not only ninjas but also rogues bigger. So uh, network disruptor becomes like a pretty decent uh, two two flyer at that stage. So that's quite cool. Um, I, I do want I do want to highlight Powell that if you ninjutsu it in, it's basically a combat trick for all your other creatures. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It might, no, uh, you will sometimes you will sometimes yeah. do it, but. Um, it's good, uh, good to highlight uh, it. But it's, it's, not, it's not like, it's not like the, the main plan. For sure. Um, <clears throat> I have the two uh, Dokushi Shadow Walkers uh, because I think that if the, the, the more evasive threats you have in this deck, I think that the more you want to have the Dokushi Shadow Walker because being able to, to drop it on the uh, board at such a quick rate is just going to be amazing. Um, I think... I think that the 3-2 uh, um, Life Linker is going to be pretty decent in this deck because uh, it gives you the cushion for your racing uh, shenanigans. Because maybe you're going to play against some decks that just let you play the ninjas because they want to race you and this is a very good way of stopping the race uh, because they can't race a 3-2 Life Linker basically. And even getting one hit with it is, 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 is pretty, pretty useful. Um, I think that in the last couple of formats, uh, the discard two card was pretty decent. Um, and this set's version of the discard two card is three mana, target player discard cards, ninja rogues, uh, you control game, menace, and end of turn. So I think that, uh, especially when you still have some kind of like a cheap ninjutsu creature in hand, you can play this and then, and still have enough mana to, um, um, to ninja something in. Obviously, I have the two Mana Wars. Uh, I think that this is like particularly important in the race uh, scenario. So if you play it as a sort of tempo, uh, either playing it just to remove the blocker and attack with everything without bothering to do the ninjutsu or attacking with something that you know is not going to be blocked and, and, and putting it in a cheap way to the battlefield, then bouncing something of theirs uh, is going to be super cool. Like Virus Beetle, if you manage to go to the situation uh, where it can attack will be a weird kind of creature in this deck that it's a 1-1, so not a big threat, but it's a 1-1 that will have to be blocked. So it will require the opponent to invest one creature to leave for blocks because if you bounce it back, you get like super value out of it. You just um, put your ninja on the board and then they will have to discard yet another card from it. So um, I think that this card can be good if you have ways of squeezing it through, uh, basically. Um, and, you know, I filled it in with some, uh, remove, um, uh, I am. Talk to me about least... Twisted Embrace, uh, Powell, because I, I noticed you included two of those. I'm not super high on this card. I think it's pretty scary that they can answer your removal spell by removing your creature. What, what do you think of that? Well, did, did you cry when you played Iroh's Blessing in... In Terrace Beyond, that's the enchantment that dealt four, right? It was a red card, yeah. correct? Three and a red enchantment. It basically, exactly Twisted Embrace, except it deals four instead of destroying, and uh, you can only enchant creatures, and it costs three and a red. That was a pretty good card. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, I think that um, um, you definitely should think when you play it, but uh, it's one of the very few um, unconditional removals in the format. And I think this is uh, something that will, you know, be useful in that. Also, with a bunch of uh, things that want to have evasion, uh, playing it on top of them uh, might be just a, a decent plan. Like playing it on the 1-4 uh, uh, flyer speeds up the clock by a lot or, or makes it a blocker that will be hard to jump over. So I no. think... You know, I mean, I put two of them, but I mean, uh, I don't think that you will very often draft two of them. And you have to keep in mind that there are there are ways of, of, of dealing with your creature. But once you know the format, you know more or less what people can have that can deal with it. And then you just play it accordingly. And, um, yeah, you know, you, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to uh, get blown out of it. It just, it's... It adds like a slight level of skill to playing this card as opposed to just your 
vanilla removal on the stick. Uh, but I think the card is still very good and it's going to be doing quite a lot of heavy lifting in this format because of the removal package is not so strong here. Yeah, so double exposure is is uh, comparing it to a fight spell, with it, which I think is a pretty fair comparison in the sense that you can get blown out in a similar fashion. Yeah. Um, but where do you like it? On, on a, so... I know we're not grading cards here, but do you pick you pick lethal exploit over it, right? Yeah, I would. So, okay, I, I think this is like the fourth time I've talked about the, talked about this card <laughs> in the past two days. But I Give think so, uh, the the comparison to Rose's Blessing is an interesting one. I think that it is significantly worse than Blessing, but that doesn't mean it's unplayable. In that, like, so Blessing was very good, but I think there's less synergies for Twisted Embrace in the set, mostly because I don't really believe in like white black artifacts and enchantments so like it has some synergies with like green enchantment stuff it has some synergies with red modified stuff but neither of those seem like that key um compared to like eros's blessing with like constellation and heroic um and i'm just concerned that this set has a lot more cheap efficient instant speed removal than theros beyond death had and that that hurts this in like two ways first of all you have better removal that you could play over instead of this, right? So, like, you're less, like, like it's not like there's no, like, Theros Beyond Death didn't have that much uh, good cheap removal, if I remember correctly. Um, like, your option in red, for example, your other option in red was, like, a two-mana deal, too, which was, like, good, but, like, you didn't have that much better. Um, and, like, you know, in black, you had final death at five mana, but that was, like, it was good, but it was a lot of mana. Um, Compared to this set, you know, you have lethal exploit, you have the two cheap removal spells in red, um, there's like the uh, blue mana war for four, there's like much more good interaction in the set, so that you have less need for this, and also, since there's good instant speed interaction, you, uh, like, it's more likely that you're blown out, and obviously you can play around that, but, like, like just because there's interaction doesn't mean it's unplayable, but it's definitely something that makes it more narrow. That said, I do like it in blue black because blue black doesn't have that much interaction, uh, and also is a very tempo game plan. So I do like. I I would. I think I would definitely play like two in blue black. Yeah. I, 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 so um, like black I green also interested because of the <clears throat> enchantment recursion aspect. But yeah. Yeah, I, I think that the, you know this is the part of it that is like I plan to be early on board and 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 provide the early pressure and that. Puts the, uh, you know, onus on the opponent to start playing blocking creatures, and you know, I can play like one drop, two drop um, uh, ninjas, ninjas to something in, and then they have to play creatures. I can play twisted embrace, kill it, attack, and actually the, the, the you know, it's basically like kill a creature, get a one one haste creature, sort of. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's where it was like really powerful in Theros Beyond Death when you get to kill their like kill their biggest thing and attack like make it so that your creature can attack past their remaining creatures. Um, and I think blue black is like the ideal home for this uh, in yeah. terms of like when you're going to want to do something like that because like other color pairs I don't really see that kind of play pattern happening that much. But here Yeah. I mean certainly. I can see that I can see that if you are in this wretched uh, white black deck you need enchantment in the end. Okay. You you guys stuck me up on it. Um yeah double exposure is asking about a card and I was also curious what card double exposure was uh was... Man, a three two draw card is like so slow. That's kind of right very interested like 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 one um what's it called from theris beyond death heliod's pilgrim is one thing like it's a three mana one two which isn't a good body like it's similarly bad to a five mana three two but at least like it at least it's only three mana so you can like actually get something like like you can uh you can leverage its tutoring effect faster here like Five mana is a lot. Which card is it? It's a five mana three two artifact with ETB. Uh, search for either a shrine or an aura and put it in your hand. Oh, okay. Like yes, finding removal is better than drawing a card. But like in Theros Beyond Death, there were like a lot of 
like Heliod's Pilgrim was good because there were a, like you were having a lot of auras in your deck and like cards that you really wanted. Yeah, and Whether, it's... like Lethal Exploit or not Lethal Exploit, uh, whatever this card is called, uh, um, is like probably decent, but probably not that. It's probably it's it's not going to be like the best thing in your deck, I don't think, and you won't have that like package of stuff to tutor out you can't get like sentinel's yeah. eyes you can't get uh, uh the three mana removal spell you can't get your busted four mana plus four plus four or <laughs> yeah no the, there was also the natural curve out the pilgrim into the plus two plus four strike make thing. oh yeah also like pilgrim into uh make them uh, discard to give it lifelink <laughs> mm. but like I, those ones I would say good times, but I hated Theros, and Theros hated me back, so... <laughs> oh, no worries, Snoop Noob. Thanks for being here. So I, I didn't include the Shrine Steward in any of my decks, but I must say I also didn't include Twisted Embrace in any of my decks. So I, I do like um, the combo that Double Exposure brings up. Like, it might be too slow or too finicky, but it's a combo. And yeah, and also, I mean, think that you sort of telegraph it away, so then they are much more some interaction for that. For sure, yeah, for if, sure. If they, if they have, you know. I think I think you'll play Shrine Steward if you, you have, have shrines. a bunch of Shrines and you're trying to be a Shrine deck. I don't think you're going to play a Shrine Steward just to get Twisted Embrace. No. And like, this, okay, there, there's a few other auras. Maybe, maybe in Black Green. It's reasonable to play Shrine Steward with, like, you know, you have Careful Cultivation, you have Twisted Embrace, um, you have the fixing... Like, I can imagine Black Green Shrines, you know, like, you have the uh, New Horizons, or I, I think it's not called that, but it's a reprint of New Horizons, like, yeah, fixing yeah. land ramp. Yeah. Just the problem is that the blue shrine is a bit bad. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean, great for ninjutsu. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, the black shrine is decent. If you like, it, it, I, the black and white shrines are, I think. Black the, one is like minus six, ones? minus walk, minus six equal to no. It's, it, it's destroy with toughness. Oh like, yeah, destroy right. Destroy with toughness less than or equal to. Similar to minus six, minus six. Certainly, if you like, ever, if you get to like play the black shrine and destroy a one toughness creature that's going to be very good like yes. you get a five man basically you pay five mana for a two two death touch etb like uh deal a damage to something and if that like kills something that's like really good yeah agree okay let's uh let's go back to celestia and uh pick yeah. it up do you want to yep. put any attention to this slide maybe we can highlight uh, the puppets before you dive in Oh yeah, you, you should you should talk about the puppet. I, I haven't thought that much about the puppet. Yeah, so so when I was building this, and and the the the, the, arc, the skeleton that we'll be showing is uh, is Jason's. But when I was building Celestia, I noted that most of my stuff had a counter, right? So either it was a saga which brings lore counters, or it was a enchantment creature, and a lot of them either enter with a plus one plus one counter or put a plus one plus one counter on something and if you try a little bit harder by starting to include stuff like bearer of memory or tales of master sashiro which is quite a decent card i think um then you you end up uh at a point where it's not very unlikely that when you play dramatist puppet you're able to put like um either remove a lore counter from a saga to uh, get the chapter that just triggered again or add a lore counter to it so that you can like get the extra effect immediately for example you can flip it immediately instead of and having the creature instead of having to wait another turn plus like putting two plus one plus one counters on two different creatures i think at that point i think that's a situation that is not like super rare i think if you if you try hard you'll be able to get there and at that point dramatic puppet is just a very very good card i would say and then i'm happy to include uh one or two in a celestia deck so it's more like if you see that your celestia deck is moving that direction then consider puppet is uh is, is the thing i wanted to mention okay let's uh, uh dive into your skeleton 
Yeah, ba basically, you know, this is this is just my green skeleton with a few white cards. Like, there's not that there's not that much else to say. Like, yeah, there's more enchantment synergies, which is great because like my green stuff was all enchantment synergies, anyways. Um, I and like I don't know. I think Imperial Oath is like just a good card to ramp to. Just like stabilizes the board, digs you to more action. Um, Probably I, I I might want a second uh, Sunblade Samurai. That seems pretty good here. I don't know why there's only one. Um, just straightforward ramp. You probably want to splash, but I didn't like add anything splashy here. Uh, oh, uh, also Spirited Companion seems pretty good here. Uh, and Ge I I also put Geothermal Kami in this deck. I don't know exactly how good it'll be, but picking up a Spirited Companion is certainly good. Um, not sure. We'll, we'll we'll have to see how it plays out. I, I made a slide about the Kami, which didn't make the cut. But I, I was considering for myself, like, how many enchantments do I actually want to pick up? And I, I ended up at the conclusion that there's quite a lot. I think Kami is quite a solid card. I think it will be, most of the cases, it will be a 4-3 that gives you 3 life, plus some extra benefit on top of that. Um, and then you're looking at a super solid card. So, again, if you have the deck for it, like with Double Companion... I think Kami is super solid. Yeah, yeah. I know, even if you want to reset the arrest, for example. Yeah, for sure. There, there, there were different French fringe cases that added up to Kami being quite nice. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Anything more you guys wanted to say about Celestia? I think Jason covered most of it. I think the deck basically builds itself put all the enchantment creatures on a pile and there you have it. Add a couple Yeah, of but again, it's, uh, don't, you don't have to lean on the synergies too much. It's of course nice to have one drop, uh, put a bunch of counters and things, but um, it's probably just going to be white, green, good cards. Another archetype that is not really strongly supported, in my opinion. But, you know, there will be some synergies incidentally because the good cards White and green turn, tend to be enchantments. Yeah, that, that's funny that you said it because I felt that this deck was super supported because basically everything fits in the archetype, right? Everything is an enchantment, so... Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, what, what, what are the big payoffs for having an enchantment in the deck? I mean, you can sure. make them cheaper with the uh, naturalist, but apart from that, it's just like, yeah, I just play some enchantments. So it's like not really a coherent um, archetype in, in that way. Like, okay, Geothermal Kami is maybe one, um, one case of synergy. And yes, there is the uh, Season of Renewal um, plus some channeling enchantments, but they might as well be creatures for the sake of that card. It's just that you will get two of them very often. Yeah, true. I think there's also a Saga at Common. I'm not sure whether it's a common or uncommon, but the first two chapters yeah, That's say, an interesting build around, yeah. Yeah, it gives something plus one plus one for each uh, enchantment or artifact you control, I think is the text. I'm not sure. Uh, but that's a super solid card in this deck as yeah, well. That's, that's just Urza Saga, man. Confirmed. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is strong. So I, I agree with you. Like, you need the payoffs to make it worth your while. But since all the other cards are basically instant slot ins, if you pick some of the payoffs, your your goal, right? It's not, it's not the A plus B type of deck where you have to actively look for both pieces to the puzzle. It's just if you have the payoffs, you'll get the rest. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm just saying that you will get those payoffs incidentally. You don't have to focus on them. Just get good cards in those colors. If you open something interesting, um, yeah. then then you're then you're good to go. And uh, yeah, you will have a couple of build arounds, and one of them is the uh, the saga that gets uh, uh, whatever. Urza Saga enchantment creature yeah. that grows with enchantment. And the other one, I think the the, the, the multicolor rare that, that just speeds up your um, uh, sagas and you can just basically lean on heavier on the saga synergies, basically. I think a lot of my drafts will start with me picking up a Tanuki and a Careful Cultivation and, and maybe I open up a good green uncommon and then I have like four or five green cards and I can basically go anywhere from that point. That I, I, I can envision... I think yes, will do this kind of thing for you. Yeah, I can envision that being my, my draft strategy for quite a while. Okay. 
So that was Celestia. We already did the mirror, so we can hop over that and we can move straight to Orzov, which was also an interesting one. We already talked about um, the, the, uh, the black and white were both at the center of the artifact enchantment skill, which, which makes both of them less supported than, for example, green and blue, as Jason already showed. And them being both at this center makes them very... Um, so at the one hand, it makes that you automatically include uh, an interesting mix of artifacts and enchantments without really trying, but it also means that you're not really focused in that sense, right? And, uh, well, luckily, Orzov has the team of artifacts plus enchantments, but yeah, that, that requires you to have two things on the board uh, for your third card uh, to, 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 uh, to pay you off. So not sure how uh, how valuable of a, of a strategy that is. What I also noted when building this is that there is a slight vehicle sub team in Orzov. So um, both vehicles are artifacts that you need for your artifact plus enchantment combo. Uh, but there are also quite some one ones in black and white. So in white you, for example, have the one one doggo. In black you have the one one insect. Uh, that are both pretty decent two drops that leave a 1-1 body after their effect. One draws a card, the other makes your opponent discard. And those 1-1s one are able to crew uh, quite some common vehicles. So both the 3-2 flying vehicle in white, but there's also a 3-4 vigilance, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, it j just uh, as an artifact. So uh, what's that called? Colorless, right? Yeah, colorless. So there is this, this artifact, this vehicle sub-team, and there is a rare that supports that, which is Grease Fang. So I can imagine if you pick that up, that you're pushed even more in that direction. <laughs> Looking at some standout cards. So if you want to get this uh, Artifact Plus Enchantment train rolling, I suggest that you play some rather cheap Artifacts and Enchantments. I think Okibu Reckoner Raid is a solid example of a card that does that. It's a one-drop enchantment that is... Uh, all three effects combined, I would say, definitely worth a card. Uh, again, Virus Beetle I already mentioned, Spirit Companion I mentioned. And I also mentioned uh, the Dragonfly Suit with the Crew one. That's also an artifact. And then looking at the payoffs, there are definitely payoffs for doing this. I think there are more payoffs, for example, for doing this than there are for having modified creatures. I like the payoffs better, but I also think it's harder to set up and I listed a couple of payoffs here. So you can imagine two and a black, three, two with both menace and death, which is pretty sick. Uh, Reign of Truth is, uh, is pretty nice. Uh, that's the one we were referring earlier as well. One and one at the end of turn for each artifact and enchantment you control. And I think the backside says something about it's a zero, zero that has plus one, plus one for each artifact or enchantment. Kami of Terrible Secrets is pretty decent. Four mana, three, four. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, you gain one life. That's super sick. So if you can make that work uh, consistently, that's definitely a good card in this archetype. And then, of course, there's the Golden Common Naomi, which, again, if you can have an artifact and a shaman on your board when you play this, is a super solid card. So I think all in all, the whole requirement for Orzov is rather tough, right? You need both an shaman and an artifact. But as soon as you got that going for you, with enough Reckoner Raids and Beetles, I think uh, uh, you're getting paid off uh, quite heavily for that. So yeah, just to, to maybe give you the context, there is three common artifacts in black and one in white. So yeah. that looks to me like a proper bottleneck, but of course you, you get some colorless artifacts that you can fill it in, but you have to really think about that because you won't get good uh, artifacts in, in these colors. Yeah, agree, agree. Let me uh, bring up the skeleton. Yeah, my main my main like worry with this archetype is just like how easy it, how how hard is it to get both an artifact and an enchantment, and like your opponent will know that you're trying to do this, so like they can disrupt you as well. Yeah, for sure. So as you can imagine, when building this. Um... Uh, this uh, this archetype skeleton, I really tried, right? So all of my tutor creatures are either an artifact or an enchantment. I know I'm playing double companion, which will be a highly contested common. So that's that's quite a leap. 
Uh, Leech Gauntlet, I think, is pretty solid. It's a solid card overall. But uh, for this archetype specifically, it's also an artifact, which I think is good. Uh, the the Reckoner Raid, as I mentioned, I think there are some solid 2-drop enchantments that are worth playing. We already mentioned Reign of Truth, although you'd rather play that later. But if you have to drop it on 2 to get your enchantment benefits, your enchantment and artifact benefits going, I think you're happy to drop this on 2. Uh, Tributor Horobi is a rare... Um, what else did I include? I think the high speed hoverbike. Uh, Sukrovich already mentioned that if you're looking for artifacts, you probably have to reach out into uh, into the, the colorless ones as well. I think in the three drop again, you have the Golden Tail Disciple, two, three lifelink enchantment. I think is pretty solid in this deck. Again, it's an enchantment, stabilizes you on the ground. Super solid card. Uh, also, here, I think the Undercity Scrounger is pretty reasonable. I think any deck where you're playing a lot of 1 1 2 drops. You'll be happy running a, a Scrounger. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the Dragonfly suit is sweet here. I'm playing double Kami. Playing no, I, think Brute, I think Brute Suit is another card that will be key here because, like, uh, like you're playing all of these two mana one one, like, kind of get your card back creatures to like fill out types, uh, right? So like, it, like Dragonfly suit, right? Instead of a three two fly, it's a four three vigilance. Yeah, yeah, shout out to that card. Fully agree. I was missing it in my skeleton, but uh, yeah, super solid. <laughs> For all the mentioned reasons. So, I was a bit hesitant building Orzhov at first, and I still think it's pretty sketchy. But uh, I do think the payoffs are there. It's just a lot of work to get there. And still, you don't play the enchantment removal. Oh, yes, I should probably include that, right? Yeah, agree. I think that were all the archetypes, right? Whee! Whee! So that brings us to a couple of final things, I would say. This is a slide we, we tend to include, which are useful links for, for more MDG Neo limited preparation. Uh, limited resources did their um, common and uncommon review already. Uh, shout out to them for doing that so early. Nikolai Bolas has a set review up. Uh, the folks from uh, from uh, Alex and Ethan did their did their review again, so you can find them both on the level limited level ups podcast feed, but also on the Lords of Limited YouTube. Um, Draft Sim has the setup as always, so you can test drive some sealed and some drafting there. It's also up on the other website, the Heroku app. Uh, so if you find seven like minded folks, you can already do uh, some some actual drafts. Uh, of the set against uh, against players. That's something I'm going to try to do on stream maybe later this week if I can find the people to do that with. And then... <clears throat> I mean, I, I wouldn't be myself if I didn't mention that you can also do it on 17. Oh, lands. yes. Can you do it with 8 there as well? Uh, no, right? That's that's similar to Draft Sim, right? You can do it alone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Draft Sim. But yeah, that's definitely a solid include. And then, yeah, there, the, the, the limited podcast field has been expanding. Uh, there's this new uh, Magic Numbers uh, podcast that I really like. I heard it's dope. I heard it's absolutely dope. Yeah, and I heard that they are throwing around a, a bonus episode, which is all about the archetype skeletons of uh, Neon Dynasty. So uh, check that out. Yeah, so if you missed part that's of that, that's very interesting. Uh, hopefully in the next couple of days it will pop in as a, as a uh, as a podcast version yeah yeah but also there's the draft lab podcast limited editions um and they mostly so for draft lab podcast i'm not sure but they mostly go over all the rares and mythics in a in a limited context so that's probably their next episode but uh i didn't get any confirmation on that but i do know that the latest episode of limited editions is uh is about the returning mechanics yeah uh paul jason thanks so much um Again, solid evening of limited chat. Where can people find you, Powell? Just Google Sherkovitz and you'll probably find most of the things that I'm involved in. So um, I have Twitch, Sherkovitz YouTube, Sherkovitz Podcast, Magic Numbers, but probably you can find Sherkovitz via Sherkovitz somehow. Um, and um, uh, I'll be in the office on Thursday if you live next to me. So Thanks. Jason? 
Yeah, I'm just Jason ILTG everywhere. Um, Discord, Twitch, Twitter, uh, mostly Discord, but uh, yeah, you, just Jason ILTG. Um, I might try to stream some when this uh, set releases. I do have. Uh, I'm I'm pretty busy, but like the site, and the set does look very exciting. So I'll try to make some time. Um, and yeah, look out for my uh, way too long threads on Twitter uh, about draft strategy. So uh, just just for the people that as as are are dumb like me and have problems remembering ILTG, I just do it. I love the game. Aha, uh -huh. that's almost what it stands for. Ooh. <laughs> Close. Yeah, and, and, and Jason, if you ever feel like uh, duo uh, drafting or co-drafting, let me know. I'm always up for that. It's, uh, yeah. It's funny. Thanks, everyone, for, for sticking around. It's uh, It's been quite a stream. Uh, but, uh, yeah, awesome to, to see you all in chat and um, uh, throwing in your, your comments. Really appreciate that.